Catch it, match it, stash it in the cabinet Listen to the chorus while let I've been scratch it This is really pop, we aiming for a classic And if we can't approach it, screw it, we'll attack it Catch it, match it, stash it in the cabinet Listen to the chorus while let I've been This is real hip hop, we aiming for a classic And if we can't approach it, screw it, we'll attack it Attack it, attack it, attack it, attack it. Attack it. What you know about classic music? What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Retro Wrestling Review Series. Today, we're reviewing WWE Backlash 2004. I'm here with, let's hope the Wi-Fi works well today. Hope I didn't just, hope I didn't just jinx it. Uh, James the Heat Man Heber, what's going on today? Yeah, as everybody knows now with the retro that I have now just re-uploaded, uh, Xfinity has been a pain in the ass, uh, for the third time this week. So this is what I've done. Just so people understand. Alright. I have. Um, gone to great lengths. To make sure the Wi-Fi doesn't try to fucking crap out. Alright. And what I did was. I. Unplugged the router. Plugged it back in. Then I disconnected from my computer and reconnected. I turned off the Wi-Fi on my phone. My dad turned off the Wi-Fi on his phone. So, if it still doesn't work and it cuts the fuck out, then it's clearly... It's not a fucking wire issue. That's a problem with the actual modem. And uh, <laughs> when I live stream. And that that's yeah. the reality of that. And then, And I have to get that fixed by Xfinity pronto. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Especially because what's up, it JJ? Like every, right. it feels like if because it, it feels like uh, every time we do a video, um, yeah, this happens now. So. Now, listen, if it goes off the air, you're not seeing another live stream. I'm just gonna be recording it with Owen right after where we left off, and then we're gonna be done with it. All right. <laughs> so that's how that's gonna happen. If you see us go off the air, it's Xfinity's fault. And it ain't mine, because I took every fucking precaution before we came on the air today. If if it still fucking goes out, nobody to blame but them. <laughs> like, I, I have no control over that, so. Can I say, though, because I went back and watched that retro, because I realized it was a re-uploaded, because I don't know the video. <laughs> oh, yeah. The edit, the, the edit you did, I've been laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the fucking XP thing, and then the fucking, <laughs> yeah, it happened again. Dun, 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 dun. I might as well have had some fun with it, bro. I might as well have had some fun with it. Why not? You it know? was awesome. There you go. But yeah, let's... Today we're covering... Uh, will be the last uh, series... Uh, of the I Backlash! Of... Yay! Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, make sure but, you have uh, the comments up. JJ was in the chat, by the way. What's up, JJ? Good to see you, I didn't brother. read it because you, you said what's up. But uh, yeah, so... It's the last uh, in the Backlash Retro, so uh, if there's other Backlash you want to watch, uh, we did uh, 2000. I know technically we didn't do it as part of the Backlash Retros, but we still did it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I'll probably make a playlist of all the Backlash Retros we've done. Yeah, but you can watch 2000, you can watch 1999, you can watch 2017, and now you can watch this one. So, uh, so there you go. We got four Backlash go. Retros ready to go. Notice uh, most of them, all my pickets. <laughs> I'm hogging all the picks again, like I talked about. The yeah, you're yeah, hogging out the picks, goddammit. I, I don't know if the 2000 was your pick, to be fair. I think it was a... That was an Indie Force pick, That I think. was an Indie uh, Force pick, and then we... And, and then, then uh, six people I picked, were on that. <laughs> I picked 2017, and then uh, I picked this one, and then uh, Chris picked 99. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Most, of, most of the Backlash picked what? I am, not, I am noticing good. that we got a viewer back. So JJ, if that's you, good to see you, brother. Uh, just wanted to yeah. just wanted to give that shout out quick while you're actually on here. But yeah. Oh, uh, 
And don't forget, by the way, too, uh, because I I forget you did one, you did you picked two thousand seven. You did that with you did that one with Casey. I did do that one with Casey. Yeah. So we so we redid a retro on top of that. So there you go. So there you go. But yeah, let's go through uh, Backlash two thousand four. Let's talk about the state of the company. I'm not gonna go over it in depth because I've said this millions of times. Uh, pretty much, uh, the company pretty much. Uh, you know, had to kind of uh, redirect who the top guy was because so many people left and all that type of stuff. Again, if you want to know why this happened, just go watch New Year's Revolution 05, uh, New Year's Revolution 06, and the Raw Draft Retro from June 5th 05 because I'm not repeating it again because it's yeah, said it like we, three we, times. We it, we, it, we're, we're just beating a dead horse. Basically, company, company needs to find big top guys because Goldberg and Lesnar left. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and that... However, though, we should talk about it looked like, anyways, at this time, that Raw was going to turn around a little bit because uh, Triple H lost the World Heavyweight Championship at WrestleMania 20. Yeah. And not only that, he was actually starting to finally put people over. Like, uh, he put over Shelton Benjamin twice, uh, and once, as, once, once in a clean pinfall, and... Uh, I think a lot of people will probably get worried. Is he just going to come back here now and win the world title since he's losing a lot lately? Um, or was this a way they punished him because uh, he didn't want to go to SmackDown, so they had to trade, like, three of the best guys I off forgot, of Raw? I forgot that was a fucking rumor at the time, that they were trying to punish him for not wanting to work Tuesdays. I forgot so, that was a thing. Yeah, so they had to get rid of, like, three of... If you think about it, they had to get rid of the best tag team off of Raw and one of, and one of the best stars on Raw... Because just to keep Triple H on Raw, because he didn't want to go to SmackDown and work Tuesdays. Um, right, right, which was a big, big thing. That would yeah. have been an interesting thing, too. Because I, I, I really do wish Hunter was there on SmackDown, like, all things considered. Yeah. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying you don't keep him on Raw just for the match, like, sign the match beforehand and have him try to win the world title here. And yeah, then absolutely. have you could even build up to have the grudge match on Raw, you know, and then finally like you know he's still on Raw contractually because he he just he he won't go to SmackDown, but like yeah, make that a loser leaves Raw match and have Michaels win, and then have yeah, that would go, and then have him jump over to, to to SmackDown. But then again, if you do that, you don't get Batista, uh, yeah, you know, rising at the top. So I don't know, it, it's. It's a yeah, double it's edge. It's a double edged sword because I would have liked to have seen an Eddie and Hunter feud. I think those matches could have banged. Yeah, especially because don't forget, don't forget they have the match on the draft uh, episode where I think Triple H gets drafted for the belt too. So hey, you um, know, you know, they could have turned Sean heel and have him lead Evolution on SmackDown, and then Triple H leads his own crew on SmackDown. Yeah, yeah, that could have been interesting I think was, too. But yeah, so, uh, but, yeah. but Rob was looking to th- turn things around too. They were building new stars. It looked like they were going to make Randy Orton the next face. Even though he's a heel here, you could definitely see that they were trying to make him a little bit of a baby face, especially with what he goes through on this show. You're like, yeah, this guy has to turn baby face, but we'll talk about that later. Right. Um, and then, uh, so Randy Orton was going to, I think, be the next top baby face. Um, obviously, that doesn't have, that doesn't really end up happening for a while, but mm-hmm. we've talked about that before. Um. And then uh, they were weirdly enough that we had new faces of Raw because we had a draft. Uh, even though it wasn't during the draft, but Chris Benoit jumped over to Raw and he was the World Heavyweight Champion, and a lot of people were happy with that. It was a new uh, face for Raw to have for the as the World Champion. Um, and then uh, Shelton Benjamin was a new star. He was starting to break out as a singles guy at this time because he jumped over to Raw during the draft. Uh, things were looking good on Raw. Uh, you know there was improvements. Um, so that was pretty good. Obviously, SmackDown, we've talked about. We're not going to talk about SmackDown because this is mainly a Raw pay-per-view. Um, and yeah, that's basically kind of it. There's not really a lot of, uh, breakdowns. Uh, TNA, um, you know, is doing pretty well at this time. They're still kind of starting out. They haven't launched the TV show yet. They're only still yeah, doing Yeah, I think they're still on the I, still on the I pay-per-views until, like, late 04, I think. By, like, November, they finally get a deal with Fox Sports Net, I believe. Yeah, definitely. Uh, ROH is doing relatively well. It just doesn't have the obviously the recognition that, uh, that it has it now. To have, yeah. And then uh, New Japan is being New Japan at this time. It's uh, and like I said, we talk about it in the 05 stuff. It's uh, 
Um, it's very uh, much just being New Japan. Um, doesn't have any recognition at all in America, really. Um, so, yeah, um, it, New Japan was also on a downswing. Uh, a lot of the Nokiaism tropes that would plague mm-hmm. the company for years would just rear their ugly head. Like, imagine, imagine WWE, but like, you know, back like put it in new japan perspective like that like and we're talking like wwe and and 20 2010 2010 onward like that's yeah. basically what anokiism was in japan it was bad they would just bring in outsider names have them beat the top guys um fucking just make giants to champions not give the fucking belts to the legit wrestlers like, it took forever for Hiroshi Tanahashi to be the guy he is today because yeah. of that bullshit. Um, and it wasn't until Inoki stepped down that we finally got, you know, Kazuchika Okada and Hiroshi Tanahashi as, like, the main guys. Yeah, for sure. But it took a long while for that to happen. And, yeah, it, it took a long... Not a lot of people remember that it took a long time for New Japan to recover from that downswing. So Yeah. But, yeah, going through... Now that we've uh, done all that, going through the show... It was a raw exclusive pay per view, so only peop- it was only raw superstars and raw personnel showed up for this show. Um, the day the- this was the first uh, backlash that was only uh, one brand exclusive because uh, I'm yeah, pretty which... sure all three was uh, both brands. So I think I think the cool. reason being is because they they uh, they brought in. I don't think they did it the year previous, but they had Judgment Day as like SmackDowns. Uh, basically SmackDown's equivalent to Backlash. Yeah. So the idea was that if they have two different styles of the same pay-per-view, then they could do more storylines that they may have had on the actual shows. Yeah, but definitely. Which, which is not a bad idea, to be honest. And then uh, the date of the show was April 18th, 2004. The city was Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, this was... Uh, one of the last times they do a show in Al- um, Edmond, Alberta, Canada. Um, mm. They've obviously been to Canada, but they haven't gone, obviously, to Edmond, Alberta, Canada. They've gone to other places in Canada. The venue was the uh, Rexall Pal- uh, Place, uh, which is now known as the Northlands Coliseum. Um, and then the attendance for this show was uh, 13,000 people in attendance. Uh, let's see if that's up from 03. And it is... It's up from 03, because that did 10,000, but I have a feeling it's because of who made events this show of uh, why this was up. So, Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, they came for one guy. Yep. The buy rate was 295,000 buys. That's a pretty good buy rate right there. Um, and, yeah, let's just get into the reason I picked this show, as I forgot to say that. Um, the reason I picked this show is... So, I originally, I picked Backlash 2017. Even though we still did that retro, I'm like, you know... We ha- I mi- well, there's a missed opportunity here because uh, there's a ba- Backlash 04. I remember uh, I haven't seen this show ever, but there's two matches on this show that I think we have. We're going to be doing a disservice if we don't go back and review Backlash 04. And that's obviously the No Holds Barred Intercontinental Championship match and the main event of this show. And I guess this show uh, I thought was better than it was going to be. It still ends up being like really good, but obviously it's just really like those two matches. Uh, that's really kind of worth watching. There's obviously other stuff here that's worth watching, but uh, yeah, yeah. The, but there is some head scratches here. But uh, the the two main matches are the main reason that we're here. So uh, you know, probably two of like the best matches I think uh, WWE ever produced at like a backlash. So yeah, true. Um, yeah. But before that, let's get to uh, well, well, let's let's also talk about who else was on this show. Uh, the other personnel we had the English commentary team of Jim Ross and Jerry the Kim Lawler. Always great to hear them on commentary together yeah. when they're young. Anyway, able to do it and yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. When they're, when they're not when they're not super like worn out and tired. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like they the Spanish, have been. The Spanish commentary team is uh, Carlos Cabrera and Hugo Zavinovich. I always enjoy hearing them on commentary, even though it's very brief here. But like you know, it's so enjoyable to see them. Like anytime there's a AAA show, I always watch the Spanish commentary team, even though I don't know what they're saying. They have passion and I love it. The English commentary yeah. team on yeah, the man, AAA they show. Sound, they sound stuff. like they sound like the football players, man. I, I just every time I just think of like that commercial. Yeah, 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 go. It's awesome. Um, and then the interviewers were uh, 
Jonathan Coachman, um, even though he, I think he does it on Sunday Night Heat, he doesn't do it uh, on the actual show since he has a match. Um, and Todd Grisham, he mainly does the interviews on the actual show itself. The win announcer was Lillian Garcia. I thought she was pretty decent here. You get, um, I don't know why she didn't feel like as enthusiastic as she normally does when I've seen her do an announcer. And it did, she did seem a little off here, but I still thought she did pretty good. Um, the referees were Mike Kyoto, Chad Patton, Jack Doan, and O'Hebner. Uh, what's it? They use O Hebner really well on this show, which we'll talk about later. So, mm-hmm. um, and obviously Mike Kyoto they use pretty well because he's Mike Kyoto. He's, he's he's he he knows what he's doing. He's a veteran. He, he does. Um, he does indeed. There was a Sunday Night Heat. I couldn't watch the whole thing because there's only a small clip of it on YouTube. They didn't show the whole thing. I couldn't. I know you can't find it anywhere. So yeah, I, um, I didn't even bother trying to watch this match. It was uh, this is back when Heat died down in uh, importance? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But the commentary team's the same. The same on Heat as it is uh, on the actual show itself. And this is when the commentary team was up towards the stage. Um, uh, for Raw, anyways, it would always be up towards the stage, which I always liked that they did that for Raw. I thought that was a way to make the shows feel different and all that type of stuff. Yeah, I wish they kept that because because it really did make the shows feel different. I, I don't know why. Yeah. I mean, I, I assume the reason being is because JR and Lawler were tired of Pyro exploding and giving them jump scares. Yeah, <laughs> so they that did. That might be why. But they, yeah. did, they did do it that way again. Um, when they bought the brand split back the second time, if you remember, like well, they would have it up. Yeah, the same, like yeah well, before. same complaint. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, but then I, there was until no... they got rid of the pyro, and then they're like, yeah. "Hey, this is better." And then I don't know what happened. I think uh, when they, because they were still that way, even like if you, because uh, you're gonna say, "Well, the pandemic made it." If you remember, they were still like up towards the stage, like even during the pandemic. Like it was, I think when they did Thunderdome, they just kept the commentary place like I... towards. The, the, the other reason that I could think as well, like, is that, number one, they could actually see the action, like, without having to look at the monitor. I know they yeah. always say, look at what's what you see on TV, but I don't think they follow that rule that strictly, even with Vince running the production. I'm pretty sure that it's probably easier to be at ringside mm-hmm. to watch a match. Yeah. And see what's going on in the ring, then see what's going on on the television screen. Because there might be something that it might be something that's happening that the TVs don't catch. And then if the announcers talk about it, then they can cut to the camera. And then it's like, oh, good call, you know? But you can't do that if you're fucking all the way up on the staging and you, you know, everything looks like fucking ant size, especially if you're in a big stadium like WrestleMania. So that that might be the reason also why they got rid of that whole deal that might be why but yeah yeah then uh the set by the way for backlash was the same set for backlash 2000 which was pretty cool um i thought uh, i liked that set from backlash 2000 the only thing is is like the fins that were like there didn't like swim around like before like you know uh someone get like you know stabbed with which we're not going to make any more jokes about that because uh, we made all the jokes about that in the back last two thousand. But yeah, yeah, true, true, yeah, yeah, yeah. We so. don't need to do that. Yeah, no, no more, no more stage hazards. Yeah, uh, stuff that they talk about that happened on the show that we didn't see that we did I didn't see on the clip, but they do happen on Sunday Night Heat. All the competitors for the uh, World Heavyweight Championship match are shown alive in Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and. Uh, the Chris Benoit one you do see, but those the ones you didn't see were obviously the Triple H and uh, Shawn Michaels one. I don't know what Shawn Michaels is doing though. He had like a suit. He bought like a whole suitcase with him. It was like, dude, what are you doing? You're you're not staying the night, but he's, he's moving. He's moving. He's he's living <laughs> in the arena now. He wants to so. revel in the heat. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing, buddy? He like, wants to hear the booze in his sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, Lowry's just down to Eric Bischoff backstage. And apparently this has to do with the match that happened on Raw where it was the Hurricane. I think it was versus Rob Conway. Uh, Eugene got involved Just in that match. look at me! Sorry. Yeah. Um, and uh, La Resistance um, wants something done about this. And uh, Eric Bischoff agrees with them. Get this and, and make <laughs> sure this autistic fuck stays in the back is basically what they were saying. Yeah, pretty I much. I still can't believe they were doing this gimmick. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make it, it. Like it's funny, but it shouldn't be. And I never should have done it. But it is by God hilarious. 
It if can be, did, yeah. It can be in the right places. Uh, this was one of those right places, obviously, because I, I think it's fucking hilarious that you yeah. likes the superhero characters. He should have... Dude, he should have joined with the superheroes and become like a superhero himself. Super Eugene. Super, yeah, that Super great. Eugene, Rosie, and Hurricane, bro. That would have been, oh, that that been awesome. Been based. Let's go. But then... Uh, but, uh... Yeah, so Eric Bischoff says that uh, what he'll do about it is he'll make a tag match. It's going to be Law Resistance versus the Hoa Kid and Rosie. And you can see where that's going to go later. So uh, we'll talk about that when we get to that match. Uh, decent backstage segment here. Afterwards, Jonathan Coachman interviews Ric Flair. And he talks about how the victories that uh, Shelton Benjamin has gotten against Triple H have been nothing but flukes. And he said that uh, he was the one that was left lame because he had uh, 16 st stitches left in his head. And you know what those 16 represent? The many, how many world championships he's won. And he basically tells Coach to get out of here and leave him alone. I and love so, uh, Flair here. That was that, I saw the promo somewhere. <laughs> I, I was like, I, I heard Rick cut a promo on Sunday Night Heat, and I watched this, and it was in like 240 grainy P on like Daily Motion or some shit. Yeah. But he's so good here. He's such a good promo. Um, give, give Flair anything. Even then... Like, he could sell it like it's the biggest match ever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he's definitely just, he's a master with that. Always has been, always will be, you know. Uh, then we have the only match that happens, and the, really the last thing that we have to talk about here, and that's Val Venus versus Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy had come over from uh, SmackDown during the draft, um, and he was getting upset that he wasn't doing as well on SmackDown as he was. No, that he wasn't doing on, as well on Raw as he was on SmackDown. And, you know, the whole thing was that he, was, uh, that he couldn't really – he was kind of going on, like, a losing streak, but it wasn't, like, a, a big losing streak. He was just kind of not doing as well on Wall as he was SmackDown. Um, but Val How, Venus – He was still version one here, right? Yeah, he was. It's, I always thought he went right to Wall and became just Matt Hardy again, but that took some time, though. So. Yeah, yeah, because then, um, then the fucking stupid Lita Kane yeah. storyline happened. Then uh, Val Venus, it was – so Val Venus was weird that he was still doing the uh, the big Valbowski gimmick because it really wasn't the era for that anymore. Like it was time for him to move on. Um, wasn't what didn't he? Wasn't he and Lance Storm a tag team or some shit? Yeah, I guess they ended that tag team because he's here as Val, the big Valbowski Val Venus here. So big um, Valbowski baby. But yeah, they have a match. Um, That's nickname for my cock. <laughs> Well, yeah, they have they chain wrestle each other for a bit uh, when no one really gets the advantage on it. But Matt Hardy's still getting frustrated because uh, he, he's not able to really get the advantage. But Val Venus is just kind of whatever about it. Um, eventually, uh, Matt Hardy starts dominating the match. He hits a suplex from the apron while Venus is there, um, sending him into the ring and really works over the back of uh, Val Venus. Eventually, uh, Venus, uh, when Hardy goes for um, a run and clothesline in the corner, Vina gets, gets his uh, knee up, and he goes to run at him, but Matt Hardy hits a uh, a, uh, a run inside Yoenagi on him. And as you know, when Matt Hardy hits this move, it's never the end of the match. It all, and he all, the guy always kicks out of it. So, uh, you know, that didn't happen. And since Matt Hardy was still doing the version one here, he, there was the Matt facts here. And the Matt fact here was uh, that Matt Hardy doesn't sit still on people escalators or something like that. People movers, I think they called it. But I don't think... People I think it's, I think, movers... Yeah. Why does and, that sound like something that Vince wanted to call it because he didn't want to use the term escalator? Yeah. But uh, it was <laughs> great because Jerry the, Jerry the Kid Lawler was like loving that fact. He's like, I can't believe that how he doesn't sit st still doing it. People movers. Um, so it's just like, yeah, I thought it was great. But yeah, Val Vader starts to mount a comeback. He gets a little bit of offense and he goes for some type of like half and half. Uh, uh, Fo Nelson, but uh, Matt Hardy counters it. He goes for the, Matt Hardy goes for the twist of fate. Val Venus counters that, and uh, then they fight towards the uh, top turnbuckle. Uh, Hardy goes for a superplex, but Venus fights out of that. Then he goes for a twist of fate, but Venus also fights out of that. And then he hits the uh, big Valvoski splash, and Val Venus wins. I didn't understand why they had Val Venus win. It didn't really make sense. They weren't really doing anything with him. Matt Hardy could have done something with. Uh, I know they end up doing something with them, but not good things. Um, but yeah, I gave this like two and a quarter stars. I thought this was pretty decent here. I just wish that they would have had Matt Hardy win. That would have been nice. Uh, 
What did you? What, I know. I know you didn't see yeah, this match, but it, no, uh, I, I agree. It was a Ron. It was a Ron uh, winner. I think I agree with that. Matt Hardy v one. It was awesome. Says uh, JJ, and I agree. By the way, he was. But yeah, I agree. Matt should have won here, not Val. Val's not the one to push here. <laughs> No way. And he, they don't push him, so it's like, why do you win? So, um, Waste of time, why not? I think, too, why, the, the reason why I was confused, he won, because he doesn't even get an entrance doing the, uh, doing the match. He, he, oh, yeah, he, got the he, gets, fucking, he got the jobber treatment, yeah? <laughs> he did. Nice. Uh, um, unless, they just, unless they cut it from the YouTube version I saw, but I think he got a jobber entrance, so I, didn't oh, get the, I don't get to understand what happened. Um... Then we had the commentary team, which I already said, and then we have the actual show itself. Uh, we had a great intro package, really hyping up the main event, uh, where it talks about uh, how all these superstars are like big superstars looking for a big rematch. It's going to be the final encounter of this main event. It was really good stuff. Go watch this video package. It's awesome. They do a really good pyro. And you actually get to hear the pay-per-view theme song, which, what, this is like, how many retros have we done, James, where we don't actually get to hear the pay-per-view theme song? It's been so money. Uh, there's been very few where we've actually heard the people. Yeah, I was shocked heard- they paid for Cell Dweller here. I really was. I, I didn't expect that. They fucking paid yeah. for Cell Dweller's theme and, and kept the theme song. It's, it's crazy. They paid for yeah. the rights. It's it's insane. But uh, By the way, in 04, in 2007, you don't even get to hear the fucking theme song. Oh, you don't? No. Because I don't... I didn't know that because I've never watched it on... Because uh, I, I have it on DVD and I get to hear it, so... Yeah, they don't uh, have it. It, it's oh. completely cut. <laughs> yeah, that's that's terrible. Yeah. Um, we had the first actual match on the show. It was uh, Shelton Benjamin versus Ric Flair. Uh, obviously, the reason for this match was Shelton Benjamin got drafted to Raw. Uh, he beat Triple H on a couple of occasions, and uh, he been, he uh, got beat the crap out of. He had 16 staples put in his head, and uh, this was a way for Ric Flair to handle uh, evolution business. Um, Shelton Benjamin? You done fucked up. <laughs> Woo! Pretty... So we had the match. Um, and yeah, they both uh, stopped punching each other. Um, Sean Benjamin hits this really stiff right hand. And Ric Flair does the Ric Flair flop, fall into the floor, which was awesome. And uh, Sean great. Benjamin... Sean Benjamin dominates the beginning portion of this matchup, which makes Ric Flair have to take a breather. Uh, but eventually, Sean Benjamin just goes out on the outside, and uh, he hits a back suplex on Flair, dropping him uh, onto the outside. He throws him into the barricade, and he like exposes like the top part of the barricade in one area, so you almost see like the bicycle rack, which was cool. Um, he hits a suplex onto uh, Flair, sending him into the ring. Um, eventually, Flair takes over. Um, he hits some really good chops on the Benjamin. This is one chop where Benjamin runs into it, and Flair just hits the chop, and it, it looks like it nearly knocked the wind out of Benjamin there. Like, I mean, yeah, um, I mean, it's a chop from Flair. I'm not surprised. The only yeah. only chop that might be harder than Flair's is probably fucking Benoit's. Yeah. Well, there's one other one, and that's uh, the Intercontinental Champion's name that we do not that is that is banned that is new. We do not say on the show. It's banned. We don't talk about. Who? Which one? Which which intercontinental? Wal- Wal- Walter, his ah, trick shot. Ah, yes, yes, that name. Ah, yes, Walter True. Yes, but he wouldn't come till later. At this point, it was Benoit. Benoit, number yeah. one. I thought he'd been like all the time in the business. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, Ric Flair takes over the match for like a couple seconds, and then Shelton Benjamin just starts mounting a comeback. He just wasn't having any of Ric Flair's offense, but eventually he doesn't have a choice, and Ric Flair chop lock Shelton Benjamin's knee, and Be- Flair works over the knee You're of Benjamin. You're going to see for me, buddy. <laughs> yeah, 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 he is. And yeah, Flair works over the knee of Benjamin. He uh, tries to lock him in the figure four, but uh, Benjamin uh, blocks it and eventually is able to like get to the ropes, which causes a rope break. And this pisses Flair off, and he eventually goes to the outside. He grabs a chair, and I think he had a plan here, but he doesn't really get he doesn't get to execute his plan because Sean Benjamin recovered quicker than he thought he would. And he had a jawbreaker on Flair and a really good heel kick, and then eventually Sean Benjamin. Starts mounting the comeback. Um, he's supposed to hit at one point, like a, a high clothesline cross body. I think it was meant to be the typical clothesline that he does, but I don't think Flair was close enough, so it just looked like kind of a cross body. Uh, but it still looked good enough. Um, I thought even JR didn't even know what to call it. Like I think that was like a high cross body clothesline type of thing because it looked like both. Yeah, um, basically, uh, it, it was basically like a uh, phenomenal forearm style, <laughs> like yeah. <thing. laughs> and then eventually, uh. 
Flair uh, hits another chop on Benjamin, and he goes into the corner, and uh, he's about to pull out brass knuckles. Uh, however, Benjamin recovers too fast. He hits he the uh, something jump from William Regal trying to hit that power to yeah. punch. Uh, punch. Not very well though, because uh, Sean Benjamin hits two jumping splashes in the corner, followed by a uh, T bone suplex on Flair for the win. I gave this match. It wasn't. Uh, by the way, it wasn't a two a T bone. He got him in a roll up. He didn't even have the T bone until way later on in the year. I'm pretty sure he had some type of suplex or something. That he did, but it was uh, yeah, but it wasn't a fucking T bone. I don't believe they they didn't oh, have okay. him start doing a T bone until way later on. I was like, what but yeah, the sure. fuck? Yeah, but Sean Benjamin ends up going over here. I thought this match was pretty good. I gave it three and a quarter stars. I liked. I thought these two worked well together. I like the biggest story in the match was Sean Benjamin was just such a talent, so athletic that Ric Flair couldn't even be the dirtiest player in the game because Sean Benjamin was just way too good for any of that. So I like that story there. What do that you think? That was pretty good. That was really good that they they told that story that he is so squeaky clean that that, that Flair cannot counteract with the dirty. He can't do it. He can't yeah. grime up that shit. He it, it, Benjamin's Mister Clean here, man. Um, yeah, man. I, I like this match. Three three to corner. Definitely a good matchup to start off the night. Uh, we've done career retrospectives on uh, Ric Flair and Shelton Benjamin before. I guess the only thing new we haven't said about Ric Flair is he's mended fences now with uh, the WWE now. So now he's kind of back working. Yeah, like, uh, give, give it give it three months. <laughs> I just I want it to be permanent just because I don't want to see another Ric Flair's last match thing again. Uh, as I said, as I said, give it three months. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, Randy Orton gets interviewed and he talks about his match coming up with uh, Mick Foley. He talks about how he doesn't even know who he's going to be facing, if it's going to be Mick Foley, if it's going to be Cactus Jack, but he said that he's going to destroy Mick Foley and he's going to end his career for good, pretty much. He got mm. a really good promo here. It was really good. What did you think of this? I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed this promo, man. Like, it's really, really good shit, man. <laughs> it just is. Yeah, it was awesome. I would say, um, I know Randy Orton had been around for a while, but I would say this is like his coming out party. This oh, show for right sure. Here. Yeah, this this is the fucking show that made Orton a star, dude. No yeah. doubt. No doubt. This the, the match. I can't wait to get to the match, dude. This is yeah. We'll get to it. I may let you cover the match, but we'll see. Um, uh, no, I mean, yeah, I'll cover certain spots, but I'll need you to fucking uh, you yeah. know you, you need to pull me on a leash. But yeah, this is uh. Here's a match here that I actually wasn't hating until the finish, but let's talk about it. It was Jonathan Coachman versus Tajiri. The reason for this match... <laughs> yeah! Um, I might let you cover this match just because of how bullsh bullshit this is. But yeah, the reason for this match, though, was because uh, uh, Tajiri uh, had spit green meats like two weeks before this into Coachman's face as like a prank. And then uh, eventually doing a match a that Tajiri... I, before we even start with that, uh, let's just talk about how this guy was like a top heel on SmackDown with his own faction at one point. Now he's just yeah. the ball again. The minute he gets traded to Raw. Let's just talk about that for a second. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> green but mist. I green mist. Like, what the fuck, bro? <laughs> you dickhead. I do like, what I do like about that segment, by the way. Is like you see the segment happen. Coachman walks into the room, and you, <laughs> it's like a media green mess too. And the way that Coachman sells the green, <laughs> he, he sells it good. He does sell it good. <laughs> probably not because probably because he wasn't selling because I, I hear that shit hurts. So it's like you know, um, yeah. I don't think it, I feel like though that the green mess is like the like. Obviously, it's they not, probably it's, they probably have work green mess in WWE. I can't imagine that shit's real. Yeah. They probably like so have like, like green. I don't know, like food coloring and water yeah. or something. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but, uh, do, but yeah, so uh, then the next week on Raw, jo Jonathan Coachman cost the Jerry a match against Christian. So, uh, you know, uh, this is why this match was happening. We were here. I'm like, okay. So, uh, obviously, they're just going to have Tajiri win here, but let's let's go through it. During the match, during Tajiri's entrance, they mention all of his accolades. They talk about how he had all these titles. They didn't mention he was cruiserweight champ at one point. They never, they never I was said he was so annoyed that Vince just... And it, you could tell that was a Vince call. Like, dude, that was his most prominent fucking title reign. Yeah. What the fuck? Like, that was his most prominent title reign was him with the cruiserweight title. Yeah. yeah, and he really suffered without Paul Heyman booking him, says JJ. Yeah, no shit. Like, it was really annoying that fucking... That whoever was writing Raw 
just because to appease Vince didn't mention the cruiserweight title. It it, it infuriated me. Like yeah. I didn't mind Tajiri like doing this fucking you know deal right where, where he's doing a comedy match with Coachman. That's not what I have a problem with. What I have an issue with is that they they're just not acknowledging what a world-class talent he is mm-hmm. like that that's what kind of annoys the shit out of me but you know yeah they, I, I think something significant to talk about too during flair's entrance and i think there's other people's entrance they actually mentioned flair was like a former nwa like middleweight champion at one point like, whoa you mentioned it that it's all well, I mean, that, like that's w- also because it's jr and he probably did that against vince's fucking yeah board, which is why but he it's got also- so much heat with him for years yeah, but it's also weird to see like that he had NWA get mentioned because it doesn't get mentioned anymore nowadays in the WWE. Ever, so. ever. Yeah, yeah. Uh but going unless Flair shows up, that's the only other time probably. Yeah, um, that's that's true. But uh, going through uh, the match, uh, obviously Tajiri's just kind of playing mind games with Coachman. Obviously, Coachman's doing a lot of things where he's trying to avoid uh, being kicked and all that type of stuff. Eventually. Uh, he goes to the out. He rolls to the outside. Tajiri follows him, and he hits a uh, really good high kick um, on the coach. But it doesn't go to coach. It, uh, he rolls out of the way, and he ends up hitting the uh, steel post. And uh, coachman uh, starts targeting the knee of uh, Tajiri. Really works over the knee. He does some decent stuff. Uh, he actually does a pretty decent Boston crab. So that was cool. Um, and then eventually he tries to win by using the rope, but Tajiri still kicks out. Um, he would get Tajiri would get flurries where it looked like he's gonna make a comeback, but Tajiri would continuously work on the leg. Then Tajiri made a comeback. He locked him in a really good like winter Saturn under the floor type of thing, not on the floor, but like on the wind floor. So that was cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tajiri starts mounting a comeback. Um, he hits the tarantula in the corner, and so let's talk about this. The reason I wasn't hating this, I'm like, you know, they're actually making this like fairly believable. Like, coach is only yes. really getting the advantage on yes. Tajiri because of bullshit. That like, so I'm like it's okay. actually it actually makes sense. Like, it feels very heelish the way they're doing it. It's not like okay, Coachman's just outpowering Tajiri, out wrestling Tajiri. No, he's outsmarting Tajiri by using some heel bullshit tactics. That's what's happening. So yeah. it wasn't it wasn't bad. Yeah, that's so. Uh, at this Until point, let me just loses. say, at this point, the match was like two and the match was two and a quarter stars. I'm like, okay, I can I can deal with this. Then the finish happened. So Garrison Cade, who I think was working with Eric Bischoff and Coach, gets up on the apron after Tajiri hits the uh, t- tarantula, and behind the ref's back, which I think he I think he clearly saw this. I, I, bullshit, he didn't see this, but. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, he hits a right. He hits a right hand on Tajiri. You're probably, you guys are probably asking yourself, "Oh, he had brass knucks on or something? Like he had, he had some type of weapon?" On. Nope. It was just a flat out right hand. Nothing else. I, and Tajiri, I, Tajiri will. Tajiri gets rolled up and Coach wins, and I'm like, "What the fuck? What just what just yeah, happened? What just?" Ha- I I couldn't fucking believe that they just buried my boy like this. Like you just got punched and rolled up, and you can't kick out. Yeah. At least grab the rope, something. <laughs> like, what the fuck? He didn't even grab the yeah, ropes. He grabbed the grab tights. A... That's nothing. Did you just kicked out of that shit before? Yeah, this was like. This took a two and a quarter star match and not like a style and a half. This was. Te- I think what made this so bad, Tajiri doesn't do. He doesn't. Be- he barely does any of his signature moves in this match. He doesn't do anything in this I, match. I had this to is... give this a zero star. I, I Like. You cannot tell me that after all that fucking fighting, that the guy loses to a punch and a standard roll-up pin. No. (laughs) Fuck off. I can't believe they did that. They they were doing so well. They were doing so well. That was the frustrating bit about this shit. They were doing so well, and then they're like, nope. Yeah. Buried him right there. <laughs> I was actually gonna come on here and give like props to Coachman because I used to always hate Coachman as a wrestler, but he actually came. To, he put his working boots let's, on. All he right, all right. Let's let's. Yeah, he put on his working boots. Let's be honest. Tajiri carried the fucking match. He's probably the one who agented the fucking thing. For all we know, Pro- Jesus probably, Christ. But it's like, like it, it's. It, I mean, it made Coach look good as a heel. It, it, it. They were. They did a good thing, and then they fucked it up by the end. 
It's yeah. Typical Vince McMahon booking, by the way. I mean, just get it, get it right until the finish. <laughs> yeah, this was to, this was this was terrible. Anything else you want to say about this? Mm-hmm. This is just awful. <laughs> like... Please move on. I I, <laughs> I I like to pretend that this never happened and just move on. <laughs> Which we, which, which we get to kind of do in a, in a second. So next match was a 2-1-1 handicap match. It was Chris Jericho versus Christian and Trish Stratus. Uh, the reason for this match was uh, back in like, uh, I think it was like right before Survivor Series, kind of like Survivor Series time-ish in 03. Jericho, well, obviously Jericho and Christian, Jer- uh, sorry, Jericho and Christian were always a tag team. They were like tag champs and everything like that. Um, but uh, then they started a storyline where... Uh, you know, Chris Jericho wanted to date Trish Stratus, and Christian wanted to date Lita. And you always knew this was something was up, at least on Christian's side of, of things, because uh, obviously they played up to the romance more so the Jericho Trish one. I'm gonna. I think the reason they didn't play up to the Lita one as much because I don't think that one got over as well as the Chris Jericho Trish Stratus one. Because I remember that I think Christian and Lita have like pe- two segments because people wanted to see him and and. Lita and Matt Hardy at that time, like they always knew that Lita and Matt Hardy were a couple. Like, yeah, so, so that was the, that was the main reason. Also, not for nothing, but like Trish, I I, I like this dynamic with Tr- Christian and Trish. I yeah, it was, really well. I thought it was smart anyway to go that direction where you know, yeah, he's, he's pretending that he's going for uh, for Lita. But then, like he's doing this manipulation where she's ruining, she's driving a wedge between us type thing. Yeah, but the, going through it though, uh, we find out though the that Chris Jericho and Christian uh, basically did a bet to see which, who could get which girl first. Which yeah, it does seem like such a Vince storyline. But the ta- Christian and Jericho are such great talents; they made the freaking storyline oh work. Oh god, like, it was phenomenal. The whole storyline was great. And then, like, I love how Christian just becomes a douche. Yeah, it, like, Jer- full on prick heel, and then because Jericho, uh, Chris is Jericho, tr- Chris Jericho's trying to defend her, her honor, but yeah. Meanwhile, the entire time she likes it rough, and she kicks the fuck out of Jericho, and then kisses yeah. Christian on the ramp at Mania Twenty, which is like, oh wow, that's fuck, yeah, that's some heat, that's some heat. It was, it was great. Like I like this a lot. Where. Well, uh, um, where they turn on Jericho and everything like that. It my was really good my stuff. only problem that I have with this, right, is I wish, I wish they kept the Trish pairing going into the next year, so that way you could have gotten an E and C Trish and Lita dynamic. That yeah, would've that would have been, been cool. awesome. That would have been they fucking might, baller. They um, might have, but I think Christian's injury because he gets a back injury later on, so maybe that. That, it, 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 th- yeah, that does happen, but like I'm saying, they could have at least kept that storyline going. Yeah, because that would have been. But yeah, cool, this is but, you know. really good storyline here. They, they did a handicap match. Uh, basically, the whole thing was that Jericho and Christian, Christian was just going to soften up Jericho long enough so that way Trish could co- just come in and make the pin. This was really good stuff here. Well, obviously, they do a lot of the classic stuff where the Jericho looks like he's going to get his hands on Trish, but then it never happens. They re- they rekindled a lot of the. Um, chemistry that Jericho and Stephanie McMahon had with each other where uh, there's that segment on the highlight wheel where uh, Trish Stratus says that you couldn't get with a woman like me because I'm a babe and Jericho does that line was like wait isn't babe a pig in a movie and he actually says the exact same line that- <laughs> and he actually says the exact same line to uh, Trish Stratus that he said to Stephanie McMahon all that time ago which was great so um, that was awesome great callback and we had the match itself um it's obviously tagged. Christian and Trish Stratus had to tag it in and out, which was fine. I thought that kind of worked out. Um, Jericho uh, hits a right hand on Christian right away, and he goes to chase after Trish Stratus, and uh, he gets cut off by Christian. But I like to because Christian doesn't even get, cut him off, really. What happens is Jericho gets in the wind and hits like an elbow on Christian, and that allows Trish to get escaped. So it's not really much of a cut off. Like Christian just got destroyed there. Yeah. And Jericho just. He just destroys Christian throughout the beginning of the portion he, of this match. He like, whoops his ass for a good was portion all... at the beginning of the match. <laughs> like he, it's just a pretty, pretty. It's not a good day to be Christian at this moment. Oh, by the way, day. let's just talk about too. Christian's theme song here is so generic as hell. It's the most generic song I've ever heard. Oh in my, my life. god! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I forgot to talk about this, by the way. I don't know if, what happened, but Flair's theme song, too, is not even the theme song that he has. In, yeah, in it's, theme it's, song, a, it's uh, some weird-ass cover of it. Yeah, it's weird. It ain't a bad cover, it's just why. Yeah, why? But yeah, Christian's, Christian's theme is just much, so much worse. Like, I don't know, what, what, what was that? Like, But anyhow, so, yeah, Jericho's just destroying uh, Christian. He hits the springboard dropkick. He uh, beats him up on the outside. And then eventually, um, there's a bit in the match where uh, Jericho bounces off the ropes. And Trish hits Jericho, and she falls off the apron. Um and uh, that allows Christian to get the advantage. I liked, obviously, the commentary here because throughout the whole night, Law was the heel and JR's the face. And this time it actually works like, Jer- very well. Jerry is very horny for Trish be liking it rough. <laughs> like, very, very but, horny. There's a, bit, there's a bit where Chris, I even mentioned during the entrances where, because uh, obviously Trish's uh, attire is showing off her uh, tatas and all that type of stuff. And uh, <laughs> Jerry, Jerry Lawler then says, Oh, look at those. And Jim Ross is just like, what? That's just boobs. You've never seen boobs before in your life? And he's like, oh, I'm talking about yeah, he, does. Talking to- he does say that. You've never, seen, you've never seen a pair of boobs before in your life, Jerry? Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then Jerry Calm Lala the tries hell to- down, sir. And then Jerry Lawler tries to go back to it and just like, no, I was talking about her eyes. What are you talking about? Like, it was just great. Oh, I, a- I love that. I love that fucking little, little chemistry that they had there. That's and then great. at one point, like, before Jericho even comes out, they are talking about Trish's feet, and like I don't even know what I, I wasn't paying attention, but all of a sudden I heard like they like wait, like I bet she doesn't even have it. I heard Jr. just say all of a sudden she, I bet she doesn't even have feet. Like what do you? How did you get onto this conversation? I bet and, she doesn't even have feet. Uh, <laughs> what? How does she do a kick then as a finish? I, 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 I think I heard it out of context, but I definitely heard something. They were talking probably about some. Feet. They were probably talking about some foot fetish crap or whatever. <laughs> I think I love it too because then when Jericho comes out, they 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 do Jericho's introductions, and then Jim Jim Jerry the Kid loves like so. Let's just go back to what we were saying. Like he brings it back up again too. Like it's <laughs> like, not like he's a drop. Very, he really is horny and wants to talk about every body part of Trish known to man. <laughs> like, what about her feet again? Ah! <laughs> that was awesome. Um, uh. This is like one of the times when horny Jerry was actually like funny here. Right? It says no data. Why is this? Oh, now it's excellent connection. Okay, we're back. Yeah, it happened again, folks. Uh, so it's it's an uploaded again. Uh, I. So the other issue that we realized it could have been, it might not be Xfinity. I've been saying it's been Xfinity, but it might not be. It turns out it might be a driver's issue. So I just updated every drive. So I'm hoping that... This isn't a fucking problem going forward, but if it is, then we know what's the fucking Wi-Fi, and I, I just, we're gonna have to deal with it until I get a new box. I do have an extra Wi-Fi stick, in which case, you know what? Fuck that. I'm gonna use that now just to be on the fucking safe side and see if that also fucking works. Yeah. See, okay. So I'm on I'm on live now. If that doesn't work, then then we know we know it don't work. But I'm gonna use the Wi-Fi stick as opposed to the Wi-Fi antennas and then see if that works as well. So I'm I'm crossing out every issue here to see what the fucking issue is. Anyway, as we were, we just got done talking about Horny Jerry. Let's get back to the match. Alright, so uh yeah, Christian just took over the match. Uh he had some really good uh, double team moves on uh, Chris Jericho with uh, Trish Stratus. She gets tagged in. She they uh, he holds her in position so she can slap him in the face a couple of times. Then eventually she hits a chick kick on him, and uh, she goes for the cover, but Jericho kicks out. And when that happens, she just immediately tags out. Um, Christian then takes control of the match. He hits a really good uh, snap suplex on the Jericho. I thought that was really nice. Um, and he just dominates Jericho for a while. He locks him into a uh, clover leaf. Not the best clover leaf in the world, but not the worst clover leaf in the world either. Eventually, Jericho gets the ropes. And then eventually, uh, Jericho starts mounting a comeback. Um, he hits a really good roll up onto Christian, and uh, he rolls. He, uh, he kicks out of it. Jericho goes for the line, so uh, Jer- uh, Christian gets the knees up. And, 
eventually Jericho goes for some type of drop kick or something in the corner. Um, and no, he goes for a high cross bar. He's gonna do something like that. And uh, Trish Stratus like uh, gro- uh crosses him um, in between the uh, second turnbuckle, and Christian hits a reverse DDT um, out of the corner. So that was cool. Mm. Uh, and uh, Jericho's able to kick out of that. Um, Christian goes for the uh, Imperia, but uh, Jericho fights out of it and uh, hits a uh, snap German suplex while Christian's on the rope. That was cool. And uh, eventually, Trish actually gets tagged into the match, and uh, Jericho gives her a, a nice little spanking, uh, puts, her, puts her over his knee and gives her a spanking. So, uh, you know, uh, th- uh, I thought that was justified considering the fact that she's been kind of a, being a bitch to Jericho, so I thought that was justified. Right. Um, and Christian uses this and hits a really good blow to the back of the head and then another inverted DDT, but Jericho kicks out of that. Um, Jericho locks in the walls of Jericho, but uh, Trish Stratus hits a blow to the back of the head, uh, which uh, you know causes uh, Jericho to have to release the hold since he got hit in the back of the head. And then uh, Jericho uh, eventually wins. He throws uh, Christian into the corner. And it's actually like an Enzigoi kick for the win. He doesn't hit like a lion sword or any of that, which I thought was a nice little finish right there. I thought this uh, match was really good. I gave it like three and a half stars. I thought uh, this yeah. match really delivered. Yeah, that's really liked, good, yeah. I like that Tris didn't just uh, – like she put her working boots on for this. Like, she did, like yeah, she doesn't take a lot of bumps till the end, but the stuff she did, she did really well. Um, I thought Jericho was the right choice to go over here because he needed to finally get his retribution. I mean, I always say, you know, since Christian won at Mania, and that's the biggest show, I think Christian's already made it. What? No, no, you're fine. Continue. Oh, okay. Yeah, like it. You were going like you were doing yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just frustrated. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, so this is three and a half stars. Really good stuff. I thought everybody came out of this match looking good. Yeah, what about you? I agree. And I just lost my phone as I say that. Yeah, three and a half stars. Everybody looked good. It's pretty good, bro. I enjoyed it. <laughs> And, you know, this feud would continue. Eventually, Jericho and Christian would have a cage match on Raw where Christian ended up getting injured. So uh, they had to pivot to Jericho versus... Uh, I think eventually he would... This is when Tyson Tonko would come in. I think he was already in, but uh, Tyson Tonko would be brought in as the heavy for uh, Trish Stratus and Christian. And uh, they kind of pivoted to Tonko versus Chris Jericho for a little bit. And then uh, Jer- then when uh, Christian came back, they f- they had fought and had that classic ladder match that I've been given for the vacant Intercontinental belt where Jericho would win that match. So, uh, yeah, they had a really good underrated feud, I thought, in Opal. I don't think it gets talked about a lot. Just it does not of- get nearly talked about enough, yeah. It was a really good feud, and this kind of kicked that, uh, kicked that off, you know, yeah. Mania 20. Next, this is... This is this is this is this was actually kind of funny. So Eugene's backstage. He's reading like a magazine. I think it's like a pro, not a pro wrestling illustrate, but some type of like Hi, JJ. Um, <laughs> pro wrestling like swim shoot magazine. But how is he? How is he? How is he I, I, sent, I sent him. I sent him the unlive link because he was listening oh, to okay. us earlier. Yeah. So JJ, just to update you to speed. Uh, uh, I, apparently, it, it might be an Xfinity issue, but when I talked to my boy, who's an IT expert, uh, Kuzon, he said it might be a driver's issue. So I just literally updated every drive before we went back live. So that's what we did. Hopefully, it stays that way, and then I can upload this and post. Yeah. But uh, so Eugene uh, is backstage. He's reading some type of swimsuit magazine, and he goes, he accidentally walks into the uh, woman's locker room. He sees. Uh, Gail Kim, and uh, he asks her for an autograph, and Gail Kim freaks out, obviously, because he ain't supposed to be in the woman's locker room. That was and then, so funny. And then uh, Molly Holly comes up, and she just had her head shaved from uh, WrestleMania 20 after the women's title match, and she lost. Right. And right. Uh, she freaks out, and Eugene freaks out because uh, she's uh, you know got her hair short, so he's never seen something like that before. And then uh, Vigo comes in and apologizes, said that he doesn't know any better. Um, and, uh, has, we, has Eugene go away and like you, then we go tries to hit it on the girls and then like they freak out. It's like, yeah. um, I like too. Cause then Molly Holly had to like put a wig on real quick. And I think this was like the first time you saw like Molly Holly without like her wig on. So I yeah. thought this was kind of, yeah, yeah. Get out. Like Regal just being a perv by accident. <laughs> it was real. This was a fun segment. Yeah. I thought it was funny. It was pretty think? good. It was pretty good. I, I, I had, a, I was sports entertained. Very yeah, sports entertained. 
Uh, Jerry Lawler like was upset that we, we Eugene did this, saying that he should know better than to do stuff like this. It's just like, yeah, what a hypocrite Jerry is right there. So yeah, true, true. Jerry does um, it all the time. Yeah. Um. Then we had a women's championship match. It was Victoria defended against uh, Lita. Uh, this was actually a face versus face match. I kind of like that they kind of uh the company really dived into it too because Jimmy Jim Ross was just talking about it all, the whole show before this match happened, saying that yeah, it was two yeah, fan yeah. favorites going at it, and they really were fan favorites. I can't really say who was more over here because I thought they were both pretty over. Um, uh, maybe Victoria a little bit more just because I thought she was a little more popular, but um, yeah, she was like super popular around this time. Like, yeah, which is just crazy. She was a real popular person at this point. Yeah, the reason for this match is Victoria. I don't remember if she won the belt or retained the belt, but she was the champion going into this match. She had that hair versus hair match. Not hair versus hair match, hair versus title match with Molly Holly. I'm pretty sure she won the belt at WrestleMania 20. And Lita won a battle royal to earn this opportunity. And obviously Molly Holly and Gail Kim didn't think it was fair. You could correct me if I'm wrong, but did Gail Kim pretty much just join with the company by this point? Like, this was pretty much like she was did, fairly new to the did company. She, I, I want to say she joined way earlier on in the year, but yeah, she might have. I remember she won the world championship or the women's was like championship a, at some point. Yeah, like first match in type of thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we had this match here. Uh, very good face versus face match here. The only thing that sucks about this match, and I think you know I'm going with this, Jerry's commentary. This is where his perfins really didn't work for the match. Because... No, because that's all he talked about, and he didn't call any of the moves, <laughs> and it distracted from the action. <laughs> it was uh, it was like every little thing he commentated about too. Like every every little uh, move, it's like I wonder what that'd be like in bed, pretty much. <laughs> like, you want to no, but... there in bed? <laughs> the fuck, Jerry. <laughs> But like there was that. But not just that though. Like you, every little thing. Like uh, tri- Lita had like a handkerchief, like in a back pocket and stuff. And Jimmy the Kimbala talked about. Like you're talking about every little thing that you could talk about to hit on the woman in the match. Basically, and I don't yeah. know. I think Jr. Like was legitimately getting annoyed. Like I think he actually wanted to like call the match, and he, he was having trouble like calling the match. He, like, couldn't, he, was, call, like, he couldn't call the match because Jerry wasn't letting letting it happen. <laughs> And the funny thing is, at this point, where Jerry actually does call the match at one point, like with those people hitting moves on each other, he said that looks nice. But because he keeps being a perv, you don't know if he's you don't actually know if calling he's the match. Actually, saying the move is nice, or they look nice doing it. <laughs> so it's like, what do you, come on, Jerry? Like, um, you be professional, goddammit. <laughs> yeah, but this match was good. Uh, they start chain wrestling each other in the beginning where nobody really gets the advantage on each other. And they kind of show respect towards each other. Kind of like, okay, I see what's going on here. And you, you'll be surprised. Like, the crowd's fairly into this match. They're probably not into this match like you, the way you want them to be into it. I think they just think that they're hot type of thing. But, like, I feel like they do enough moves in the match where they where kind the of, crowd like, actually gets into the match itself as well. Yeah, by the way. Yeah. Oh, by the way, in the entrance for Victoria, she kisses a child on the cheek. Like, I think that was a ma- that must have been like make a wish then. Because, yeah, uh, it must have been. Yeah, it, I can't imagine why she would just randomly gets a man on the cheek. I'm just saying, <laughs> unless yeah. that was her gimmick at the time, in which case, weird, Vince, weird. But it lo- but you could tell it looked like it looked like a make a wish type of child. Yeah, it does seem did. like it. Yeah, probably that's why. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this was uh uh. Victoria dominates the beginning portions of this matchup, just kind of hitting some nice uh, slams and. Uh, power slams and, uh, you know, big boots and things like that. Eventually, Lita makes a comeback. She does, like, the lucha style in the match, uh, doing, like, a lot of head scissors takeovers and uh, a lot of dives on the outside. Um, and, uh, it was, yeah, it was just, good, just, it was just uh, some good stuff. Uh, Victoria tries to go for some type of, like, um, like backslide, but Lita uh, turns it into one of her own. Um, Lita, uh, Victoria goes for the moonsault. I think Lita was supposed to move, but she didn't quite get out of the way in time. Like, Victoria still got some of the impact on the moonsault, but, it, you know, not enough of it where Lita was still able to recover and all that type of stuff. So that right, was cool. Yeah. Um, eventually, Victoria wins the match with the roll-up. I give this match, like, three stars. I thought this was a good match. This was a I great match, out. yeah. It was a great women's match for the time. Like, these these ladies brought it, man. They, they were great. Yeah. They were phenomenal. Right after. Right after the match, Gail Kim and Molly Holly attack him. They throw Victoria into the post and hit like a double back suplex on Lita and completely lay him out. I thought that was fine. It was a good way for them to get heat. 
Um, I like the fact that they waited to laugh at the match because, uh, you know, um, I, I, you actually would have thought Vince would have booked like a DQ finish, but they actually, he actually had the match happen and like they didn't want right, to feel yeah. like on their behalf. So I, I liked this. I, I thought um, this all set up some really nice stuff. You could make the argument, you probably could have seen this on Raw, but I still thought, you know, this was still good enough to see on like a pay per view type of thing. What did you think of this overall? Uh, it's pretty good. I, I, yeah. I thought it was all right. I mean, they have the, you know, they're getting more women involved in the, in the angles. It's good shit. And plus, yeah. there's still that issue with Molly Holly, and now Gail Kim's involved, so it's cool. Yeah. I think this is um, when Gail Kim was, like, trying to do her Neo phase. So she was it was, like, yeah. Ah, I, I like Neo. Look at me. <laughs> and again, no need to do career retrospectives on Jericho, Christian, Trish Stratus, Victoria, Molly Holly. Gail Kim or Lita, because they are, we've done, uh, literally, you know, one of these, yeah. I think everybody on this show, I'll just say right now, we've done a career retrospective for. So, so there you go. um, I, if the if if your wife if the Wi-Fi wouldn't but that wasn't an issue, we could have like had this would have been one of the quickest retros we've ever done. So yeah, exactly. Um, right. I like how that's. I like how we say, "Oh, we try to do this to save time," and then we it didn't happen. But whatever. Yeah. Well, um. Then we have probably the match of the night, probably match of the year. Uh, it's a no holds barred evolution ban from Windside match for the Intercontinental Championship. Falls count anywhere, also. It's Randy Orton defending the Intercontinental Championship against uh, Mick Foley, with who we thought was going to be Mick Foley in this match. But let, yeah, what it's, Cactus right it's Cactus yeah. Jack. It's Cactus Jack. It's Randy Orton versus Cactus Jack. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, going through the reasoning for the match and everything like that. Uh, obviously, Randy Orton won the uh, Intercontinental Championship uh, at Vengeance, not Vengeance, Armageddon 2003. And uh, he was supposed to defend the belt, like, I think the next night on Raw or something against uh, Mick Foley. And Mick Foley came back as, like, a version of Commissioner Mick. This was when there was, like, the Koji Emma then again, where Eric Bischoff and Mick were running the shows. And Mick walked out of the match. He didn't feel... His heart wasn't in the match. And Randy Orton was being very disrespectful to Mick Foley backstage about it, spat in his face, and says that this is not the Mick Foley of old anymore. And it led to weeks where Randy Orton would just chastise Mick Foley for not being the, the old Mick Foley. And uh, it led to Mick Foley returning at the Rumble, where uh, he, you know, attacked Randy Orton, eliminated himself and Orton from the Rumble. They had that big brawl at the Royal Rumble, and they would just get involved in brawls. Randy Orton would lay out Mick Foley time in and time out again with the help of Evolution. There's that infamous segment where they beat him up in the office, and yeah. the biggest segment is obviously when he kicks him down, the, when he punts him down the stairs. Um, I think it was at MSG. I'm pretty sure it was at yes. MSG show. Yeah, it was an MSG um, show. Yeah. And then they had a, a, a two-on-three handicap match at Mania where Mick Foley teamed up with The Rock to face uh, uh, three members of Evolution. That was everybody except for Triple H. And Randy Orton got the pinfall on Mick Foley. And Mick Foley just had enough. He wanted to finally get put an end to this and, and finish off Randy Orton for good. And um, he basically challenged uh, Randy Orton to this match right here. And I love the video package because uh, Randy Orton obviously uh, accepts the match, but he obviously like looks like he has second thoughts about it. Yeah, because he knows is... he knows that if he accepts this, there's there's an he might have an issue on his hands. But I like that he kind of has no choice but to accept this match because he has like prove himself. He has to prove to Mick and to like himself that he can hang with the big boys type of thing. Right, um, yeah, and uh, yeah. The biggest thing in this hype is the infamous promo Mick Foley cuts. I don't, I don't know what exactly may, what. This may be his best promo. I don't think people realize how good this. Yeah, is. do you want to, do you want to talk about the promo? I, because I uh, couldn't even, I couldn't even begin to tell you. It, you would have to watch it for yourself to understand how good this is. I couldn't do. But it pretty much, this. pretty much, it's a promo where Mick Foley like talks about what it means to be hardcore, and you're probably thinking, you guys are probably thinking to yourself, if you've never seen this promo. Oh, that just sounds like a typical Mick Foley. But no, no it, you know, it's, this is like all timer underrated. Like this shouldn't be underrated. Like it should have been yeah. all timer. This is the best promo he's ever cut in the Fed. Period. Yeah. Like this, there's Probably, no, there's no promo that tops this promo from Mick. At least in WWE. Not, not just in the Fed. This might be like the best promo he's ever cut. Like it's in, in, in his entire Dude, it career. It was so good. It was so <laughs> yeah. good. Like so, like you were scared for Orton. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were scared for Orton after this. <laughs> the promo is so great. It might that we might have to do like a retro of like that law. That's how good that promo is. Dude, someday. It is, like, it is phenomenal. <laughs> phenomenal fucking promo from Mick. Yeah. All like, like S tier type promo. Like it was it was phenomenal, man. Like it I did not expect that great of a fucking promo. I remember the promo being good. I just don't remember it being like that good. Yeah. So, yeah. This is awesome. And, uh, and I know some Cassis of it. Says, I know JJ says fail, uh, fully made Orton in this match. He, they sure yeah, as hell did. We t- we just we talked about it like earlier. This was this show right here is Randy Orton's coming out party in the WWE. Like he was made on this show. Um, let's talk about uh, the match itself. Like oh my gosh. Um, mm. So Randy Orton comes out. You know he just kind of comes out with like he comes out with like a various weapons. He comes out. Um, you know, with a trash can and all the type of typical hardcore weapons. Mick Foley comes out dressed as Cactus Jack, um, and he only has his Bobby. And uh, he comes Barbie, out. Barbie, a boy, like that was the fucking. And he's going hauling ass to the fucking ramp, by the yeah. way. He's hauling ass there. And he and he and the match before the match even starts, he's going right after Randy Orton. Randy Orton's in the corner. He's trying to hit Big Foley. He's trying to hit um, Orton with Bobby, and he's using a trash can to block and bend in this trash can. The ref just has to win the bell. And I know a lot of people don't typically like so Big Foley's like chasing Randy Orton all around the ring and stuff. And I know a lot of people typically don't like the shaky camera work the WWE does, but it really worked here. Where like it, it, they had, Foley they was had, coming yeah. after Randy yeah, Orton. It made it feel way more chaotic. Yeah, I feel it was way just, more chaotic. Yeah, eventually Randy Orton uh, uses an underhand attack and dropped hold, toe holds uh, Mick Foley into the steps, and he tries to like uh, hit him with Bobby, but Mick Foley's able to block it, and uh, he Mick Foley just beats up Randy Orton, bounces him uh, head first onto a chair. This is where that k- shaky camera work kind of happens. It was really good stuff. And then uh, Mick Foley just, like, dominates Randy Orton throughout the beginning portions of the matchup. Doesn't do anything, like, too crazy hardcore-wise, but he just kind of does, like, his typical Mick Foley stuff. Um, he does, like, a missile drop kick to Orton on the outside, setting him to the outside. He does a really cool thing where he runs outside the ring, um, and he hits, like, a swing and neck breaker to Randy Orton onto the floor. It was really awesome. Yeah. Um, this is fucking great. Yeah, Mick, Fo- uh, Mick Foley grabs, uh, hits him with a cookie sheet, just bends it right across his back, takes the bed trash can and hits Randy Orton off the head with it. Um, and, uh, yeah, eventually... Dude, he, uh, he, is, he is fucking up Orton from the offset here. Like, right uh, away. Has hits no him with remorse. Ch- <laughs> yeah. Hits him with a chair. Um, and then Randy Orton kind of, like, has to, like, stagger away, um, really take off right here. And then eventually this ended up being a trap. Uh, Randy Orton sends Mick Foley... Um, and he drops him neck first. He hits a back suplex, dropping him head first onto the ramp. Now, I know the ramps are still pretty hard nowadays. This ramp would have made, like, any WWE ramp nowadays look like it was cushioned because this ramp dude, was called that big hole. Dude, he the fucking on. got dumped onto this ramp. It looked like it sucked. Yeah. Oh, God, Man- it looked awful. What an awful Man- bump. <laughs> Randy Owen goes for the cover. Uh, Mick Foley kicks out of it. And uh, Randy Orton dominates the match for a bit. He hits Mick Foley off the head a couple of times with a trash can. Um, hits him with a chair. Hits him with a. Um, he hits him with Bob with a Bobby, um, which is just really good stuff. Eventually, Mick Foley just snaps. He goes after Randy Orton. Hits a low blow onto him, um, and he just starts. At this point, he just kills Orton like yeah. for a while, like yeah. for a long while. Like long he hits him with a trash time, yeah. can. Um, he uh, grabs Mr. Sacco and he asks people which one they want to see. Do you want to see, see him use Sacco or do you want to see him use the Bobby? And everyone chants more for Bobby. And he smashes Orton off the head with Bobby. And Orton gets busted open. He grinds him with Bobby like he said he was going to do in the promo. Um, the crowd is going he, nuts for every bit of this, by the way. Like, there's yeah. not a single person sitting down. He, dro- he, he, hits like, he drops Bobby like he, he hits him. Bobby does like an elbow smash onto Randy Orton's head. Yeah, with fucking Bobby. cactus elbow, I think, at one point with the fucking yeah. Barbie. Then he has this moment where he grabs a uh, lighter fluid, um, gasoline, and he's going to set uh, Bobby on fire. 
and Eric Bischoff comes out and says, Foley, you do this. Um, not only will you lose the match, but the fireball show is pretty much going to come out and shut down this pay-per-view. And uh, basically no one else will get to see the show and everyone's going to have to go home. No I... refunds or anything. So many people booed this and thought that this took away from the fucking match. I was like, no, nah, this works. Yeah. Nah, this really works. Because, like, you got to imagine, like, like that was a thing for a long while, like, fire marshals. So I'm glad they actually used that. Like, they actually used a real-life thing that could happen in sports. Yeah. To, like, sell the severity of this match. I, I feel like I crap. Awesome touch. Yeah. I would crap on it because if like it led to Randy Orton getting the heat, but I actually like Randy Orton doesn't even get the heat after like like fully still dominate. So I did like if it led to the heat, I probably would have complained about it. But I'm glad like fully did stay dominant after. Yeah, that, yeah, too. like he just it didn't matter type thing. He was just using it. And so, then yeah. uh, he pulls out a board, and it's like filled with Bob wire like on this board. It's insane. Um, I know like. Uh, they did it in AW at full gear. This looked like legit. Like this could have hurt. I know the one at full gear looked um, like it could have hurt, oh, but this it one looked hard. Like, it looked hard to take. Yeah, but this was fucking brutal. Yeah, brutal yeah. here. Um, and Randy Orton hits a power slam onto uh, Mick Foley onto this board, and uh, he hits a suplex on him, driving him onto this board. Um, and Foley just goes full on into the barbed wire there. Like it was awesome. And then he uh, pulls out the thumbtacks because um, there was a there was a box and then it was in a bag and uh, big mistake Orton because uh, who, you set up the thumbtacks you're going into him and that's what happened he goes for the RKO and uh, Foley counters it and he shoves Orton right into the thumbtacks and Foley goes for the cover and believe it or not Randy Orton kicks out um, yeah I know I I know it doesn't it sound it doesn't sound that uh, out of left field, but this you gotta remember this is young Randy Orton who was still like a chicken shit heel at this time, and he was kicking out of this stuff like it was insane. Yeah, he was like um, kicking out, and Foley was like wondering what the hell to do afterwards. Yeah, like, he thought that I was like. It. I think this might be the best. We re- I know Edge did it really well at WrestleMania 22, but this might be like the best reaction I've ever seen someone take when they went to thumbtacks. Like Randy Orton rolled out of the ring, he was pulling yeah, the thumbtacks. He, he was like fucking yeah, and it was. It was sold by Jerry and JR as beautifully on commentary also. Yeah. And then uh, they fight. They go backstage. We don't see them for a bit. They never get, like, a camera back there. I don't know what was going on IOL if, uh, you know, they were, like, trying to get – because he doesn't. He, when he comes out, he doesn't have as many thumbtacks, so maybe, like, they were trying to get a th- thumbtack. I'm not sure what they did backstage, but Foley eventually pulls them back out, and he tosses Randy Orton off of the stage. And at this point right here, Jim Wa- – like, because – Lawler obviously is being a heel, so he thinks this is too much. And Jim Ross like wanted to see Randy Orton get come up, and when Orton gets thrown off the stage, even Jim Ross is like, "Okay, Vic, this is too far now. You're, you're going way too far." Tossed like him that. off the thing, and keep in mind, there was there was like a thing of wires down there, like to yeah. make it look like so he's going full on into these fucking giant ass cable wires and, and tables just, and stuff too. And yeah, tables, and he just fucking crashes and burns. Yeah. And then Foley um, does the cactus elbow off the fucking stage. Yeah. After and that's like what, a minute of letting him just lay there. <laughs> yeah. And Fuck. I like I like this. He, he even decks referees and like this is when G I was like, okay, Mo- Foley, this is too much. And then Foley goes for the cover. And he's on the stage, by the way. It's not like they went back to the window and no one had time to cover. He goes for the cover pretty much like straight away. And Orton still kicks out. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah, like, like was... that was nuts. And the crowd was like shocked by that. And it was like, it really put over Orton huge here. Yeah. And then uh, they fight back to the win. And uh, Foley hits a double on DDT on Orton. Orton still kicks out. And then eventually um, the he go, he does the uh, mandible claw with Sako. And Orton uh, uses an uppercut and then hits a low blow on Mick Foley. However, he still comes at him with the uh, Mandible Claw. And I can't believe no, this is probably the most underrated RKO ever. Ever. Just because, uh, ever. Pinpoint bullseye hits the RKO on the Barbie baseball bat. Fucking no, barbed not that. wire. There's one before that. When he has the Mandible Claw, he hits the RKO while in the Mandible Claw onto the thumbtacks. Like, oh, yeah, that's right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. 
I can't believe because this. And then he kicked out and, again right afterwards, huh? Right yeah. after that. Yeah. Then he does the LKO under the baseball bat, but that's underrated th- too. I'm shocked yeah. that's not up on the list. On, on I know. people's top tens best RKOs of all time because that was out it's of like, fucking nowhere. He just bullseyed that shit. And Randy Orton went to, went to the match, retained his Intercontinental Championship, and yeah, Randy Orton was made in this match. Like yeah, this match yeah. Well, JJ Randy said it too. Match. Like Foley was made by Orton on this ma- in this match, or Foley made Orton in this match. Excuse me. And he said the second. Uh, he said this promo was the second best. He thinks the promo uh, with. Uh, Kane Dewey from ECW was better, but I don't. Oh, that might be a good one. The, honestly, I could see that, but I I don't know, man. There's something about this promo that hits different for me. Yeah, like but I've yeah, seen this that is promo a... also, but this hits different for me. Yeah, but this was just awesome here. I think the best part about it too was they didn't do any bullshit where like ever like you would have thought like when they went backstage like El Evolution would have just like it like they would have found like a like loophole saying well we won't win side but we. They, they like steal the field. That anyways. could have been that could have been their loophole, yeah. But they, they, I'm glad they didn't do it. I'm really happy they didn't. And this is why sometimes I think people complain about like later in the Vince era years when like pe- when chicken shit heels, uh, you know, never won uh, clean. They don't always have to win clean, but look at what happens. Randy Orton, who was a chicken shit heel, actually went out there, beat Mick Foley without any help, and made Randy Orton. Yes, right yeah, he did, and. Yeah, Randy Orton was just made here, and uh, it was awesome. They clear. I think he was. They you could see why he ended up turning face later on this year yeah, when course. you watch his match. Um, yeah, I mean, sucked. after that match, like no shit. Especially they they were in the same country for SummerSlam. No shit, they were gonna cheer for him. Yeah, after a match so, like this, shit. Yeah, and you know this match is four and three quarter stars. It's just fantastic. It's awesome. It, I it, it. Dude, I gave it five, full five. I fucking there was yeah, it's just, not a single thing I didn't hate. I, I didn't like about this. Why not? I'll give it five stars. Yeah, like there not? was there was there was like literally, and even a, a, even the whole fire marshal bit. I think it sold the severity of this man. Like I yeah. gave it five all day. This the best. was the best hardcore match post hardcore title that WWE has ever done might be the best hardcore yeah. match they've ever done period yeah it might be um but yeah afterwards too uh you know uh the commentary really puts over Randy Orton saying that he, he he was uh how tough he was even JR Lala was just really healing and he's not being tougher like, than a two dollar steak and Jerry goes wait a minute that's all you have to say about that <laughs> I love to know even JR just didn't want to give him credit. I love that. Yeah. I even love to like uh Jerry Lawler even says, wait a minute. if Randy Orton walked on water, you would just say that he can't swim. Like Lawler was great all night, right? Here. Well, up until the except the women's matches, but he was just great being a heel. He all was night. such a great heel. This might be one of his best hom- uh commentating performances, honestly. Yeah, this was just fantastic. Uh, the only thing that I mean, the thing that sucks about it is when he would wrestle, though he'd be a face. It just never made sense. Like if you're a heel in commentary, you should be a heel all like in the wind. But it was just weird. But, yeah, that, I agree with that. I do agree with that. But so know. the next it shows a uh, a DVD ad, John Cena World Life, where it just is going to show all the bat battles and all the moments of John Cena. I'm like, what, <laughs> what do you do? It's only been in the company like two years. How does he already have a DVD coming out? It doesn't, make, it doesn't even make sense. Like, Why not? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> the ad for it's really cool, too. It's just John Cena rapping about to everyone to basically buy the DVD and all that type of stuff. Really you better cool. buy this DVD, you bitch. <laughs> I think DVDs were starting to become... I mean, they were, they were really thin, but like they were being, there was more being made around this time. Because VHSs much, were yeah. kind of being phased out, so it's like, yeah. Yeah. Then, evol- then evolution's backstage. They have Ric Flair and Batista are helping Randy Orton, and Triple H congratulates him, saying that's how Evolution does things right there. But it's not really a full on congratulations. He doesn't really focus on Randy Orton's moments. It's kind of he still kind of goes in front. Fo- like he cut. He kind of. That's what off Evolution's all about. Like it was an Evolution thing. Yeah, well, not, not a Randy Orton. Thing. Not a Randy Orton thing. <laughs> and then he gets interviewed by Todd Grisham. And he gets asked, uh, now that Evolution's one for one, what are your chances of winning the world championship tonight? And Triple H just scoffs at him. It's just like, 
I'm going to reclaim my World Heavyweight Championship tonight. I'm going to prove that WrestleMania was nothing more than a fluke, and I'm going to have the throw back around my waist, and Evolution's just going to go celebrate. And he basically just leaves. Like, But you can just tell with the tone of Triple H, he did not like Todd Grisham's question. Like, no, he, he like hated it. He hated it. How dare you? How dare you think yeah. I'm not going to win tonight? Dare, damn you. Yeah. What do you think of this backstage segment here with Evolution and Todd Grisham being Todd Grisham? Todd Grisham was nice. Triple he was H nice. Was great. And yeah, he should have known. It was he should have known. Thing. He should have known better than to ask a question like that. Though, I so. yeah yeah maybe maybe but you know hey listen he's got to do his job somehow you know he's not a mean gene not everybody can be mean gene. <laughs> he's definitely not a mean gene. No. Um, next match was uh, La Resistance versus uh, the Hurricane and Rosie. Um, this match was basically just the cool down match, which I think was. I, I, I think I, it needed. Yeah. My thing, it basically uh, was a comedy match halfway through because Eugene comes out and he does the yeah. same thing and you know he's running all around and running the ropes in the midst yeah. of a fucking sanctioned match. Referee's trying to get him out and he distracts yeah. Lava Sissons to get rolled up and lose. No, and lose. Uh, yeah, no, it's not a roll up. He they hit the he hits the reverse uh, DDT for the win, so it's not right. a roll up. I, I'll be honest. I, thought, I, 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 I understand your whole idea of like, let's break this down for a spot. Why? There was yeah. no need. <laughs> like, it was just get, basically a cool down match, man. I gave it two stars. I thought it was. I thought it, it was, was fine. Solid, it was a. It was okay. <laughs> we needed. Yeah. We needed a cool down. Match. I still. I still think Bad. your boy Rosie gets. I still think uh, your boy Rosie gets done dirty here by the way because right when he gets the hot tag eugene's already out there they don't even care about Rose oh my god the yeah they, uh, they man they fucking let three <laughs> they should have let three minute warning succeed damn it i by the I way like, fucking haku should have been the leader of three minute warning i, I like rico and everything but come on <laughs> yeah i also do you remember rosie's mask also comes off at one point which i don't think was supposed to happen i think his mask legitimately fell off it was really <laughs> yeah funny. i don't know he well he is you know he is shit Superhero in training, so that's true. Yeah, um, yeah, this was fine. Like a nice little cool down match. You could definitely tell this was a cool down match because the commentators aren't even talking about the match either. They're just talking about the hardcore match that they just saw and how insane that was. So yeah, this is a cool yeah. down match. So, yeah. Um, better than the cool. I would have put this in the cool down match in the next match because I probably would have hated the next match even more. And that's Kane versus Edge. The reason for this match was Edge had just returned during the draft. He got drafted to War. Uh, he speared Eric Bischoff, which if you watch that spear, Eric Bischoff does not take that spear well at all. That might be the worst spear I've ever seen in my life. Um, yeah. And uh, Edge had it. I don't remember what Edge got injured from um, because he comes back here with a broken hand. But I don't even think it was a broken hand that um, he was even the injury that he had at IOL. I think it was something with his neck. Um, so yeah, the neck injury. He might have maybe he broke his hand along the way too. I don't know, but. Uh, Maybe Kane, he broke his hand along the way. <laughs> but Kane uh, viciously attacked Edge at one point, um, and he was going to end him with a chair by putting it through um, by with his other hand and stuff. And Edge used the cast to get out of that situation and laid out Kane with a spear. So Johnny Nitro, who was uh, the assistant of Eric Bischoff at the time, basically added a stipulation in that uh, if Edge, if the referee catches Edge using the cast in the match with Kane. He will be. Uh, he will lose the match by DQ, um, and he'll be suspended indefinitely. So right. Edge laid Edge laid out uh, Johnny Nitro. We had the match. Um, it's clear they just wanted to get Edge on the show somehow because uh, he's from Canada. He's from Canada. Edge, you wouldn't be able to tell because nobody had a reaction. Not a single yeah, this person is, had a reaction. This is when this is when Edge is a babyface. Uh, Stopped working. I feel like uh, there's a reason he has to go heel later on because he, his baby face run did, really faded. Did out. the affair with with Lita happen around this time and the fucking people? No, that's not knew it. Or that's not that's not for a year. That's still not for a year because because don't forget that that's still not for a year, bro. This is all for right. Yeah, I mean, but so okay, so yeah, because I was always confused why they just started randomly booing him. I think I just think he was. I just don't think he really worked out as a babyface anymore. It's really weird, yeah, because he just came back and everything like that too. Like he, he actually it, went, It's not like he did anything egregious or anything at yeah. that point to get booed. He just was getting booed, and I, yeah. I never understood why to this day. Yeah, that he was weird. Yeah, um, he went back to the Edge and Christian theme song too um, at this time too, which was odd. 
Um, yeah, instead of being with Rob Zombie. Yeah, that was a, that was a very odd decision. Uh, Edge starts off the match uh, dominating. Um, you know, he's uh, fairly dominant towards Kane. He gets a really go- cool heel kick on Kane. And I liked one bit where, like, he had to hit a clothesline and he had to use the good hand, but then uh, he went to, like, use the bad hand for another clothesline. Uh, but then he remembered he had to switch hands, so that was kind of cool, I guess. That was then eventually, good, yeah. Then eventually Kane takes over. He uh, hits a big boot on Edge on the outside, and then he throws him arm first into the steps. Um, he targets the hand of Edge um, and just really works it over. Eventually Edge mounts a comeback. He gets a really cool heel kick and um, gets a nice offense in on Kane, and then eventually Kane hits the uh, flying clothesline and uh, the sidewalk slam, but Edge kicks out of all that stuff. And then eventually um, the FOE goes down, um, and he's outside the win, and the ref doesn't see... And I think at one point in this match, fans chanted, you screwed Brett because it was Ohebner that was the FOE, and obviously he was, this was like... he was The, the Montreal screwdriver was very much a thing, so the fans were kind of shitting on Ohebner a little bit during this match. Um, and then eventually... Um, Kane goes for a choke slam, and Edge uses the cast to get out of it, and then hits Kane with a spear. Wins. This is two stars. Nothing wrong with the match. I just really wasn't a fan of this match. I don't understand why they did this match. It just felt really random. It, um, it, it did and, feel. It did feel very out of place in the show. Honestly, and Kane. Feel. Yeah, Kane's stock just really went down during this. This was right after he got jobbed out by Taker in his return, and was too afraid to face the Undertaker, and. This is Kane, by the way, a monster who was still fairly protected at this time. And all that took to put down Kane was a cast shot and a spear. Are you kidding me? Yeah, this was right? just so stupid. Uh, that might be we, why. I, maybe maybe they just booed him because of how he he was uh, how J- Kane just got kind of jobbed. Yeah, um, this is when Kane. This is when Kane's stock in the company was just real. This really went down like hard. Like he just became a normal wrestler pretty much after this. And then obviously that leader storyline was about to happen, so that wasn't going to do him any favors. Like they just started fucking Kane over hard, and it's it's to the point where like Kane had to put the mask back on. Like and it was just way too late by the time he put the mask back on. It, yeah, it was just yeah. What did you? This is a this is probably a, it, this is an example this is an example where if it's a match of two stars but it's like a bad two star match. It's versus yeah, a, yeah, it's not great. Um, JJ said the affair with Lita was in early '05. I remember meeting Edge on the road to WrestleMania tour, heading to 21, and the news just had just barely broke. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. I guess it happened around Mania 21 time. Uh, so yeah. uh, I don't know why they. T- I don't know why they booed him. I assume it's because of how Kane was treated, and so they yeah. they really wanted they they really didn't care about how they used Kane. Yeah, so that might have been why. But yeah, it yeah, was, what did you, it was fucked. What did you think of this match overall and your style rating and everything? Uh, average, very very low average, honestly. Um, I think it just comes down to one of those things where you look at this, and Kane never should have gone heel. If mm-hmm. anything, Kane should have been an anti-hero, just fucking up anybody and everybody because he was just psychotic after losing the mask. That's really what should have happened here. Yeah. Um, if that were to happen, like, yeah, you could still do the thing with JR or whatever, but that doesn't mean you turn him full-on heel. Like, you should make yeah. him a baby face. Like, or, I, I, or an I anti-hero, like... you know, fucking yeah. up anybody and every, everyone, you know? I mean... It... And it's kind of t- you can't really do the thing with Jr. though if he's uh because everyone likes Jr. well enough where I feel like uh it would you're, turn you're... him heel but at the same time it's also Kane completely unhinged yeah so that's true. It, 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 depending on how you do it yes he fights heels he fights baby faces whatever but like you know the whole thing with Taker fucking ruined him yeah definitely like because why why are you having why are you having him help. Vince McMahon, you know what I mean? Yeah, like I don't, that doesn't make sense. It, yeah, I feel like uh, definitely do the match with Taker WrestleMania twenty. I don't think there was really anything wrong with that. Just don't have Kane get bitched out because you got bitched out bad in that match if you remember. Like it was he bad. got he like, got fucking destroyed. Yeah, like not it, even just it, dest- he he literally was down the totem pole after that. Yeah, not even just like not even the fact that he just gets destroyed. He was he was like so scared of the other. Un- It'd be one thing if he got destroyed. Yeah, you are not real, he said. Yeah. 
you know you know he could rise from the dead you moron like yeah. it, he made him look like such a joke yeah it was just terrible like yeah so f- fuck this man like i hate how they yeah. use kane like we talk about it every year like if if every every retro we do if 2001 to 2002 was the hottest period of kane Katie Vick onwards was like the worst time of his career. I, I would I would even argue to say it it just is kind of a lull. It it's not good or bad by like the time he teams up with Big Show onwards, so it's okay. Yeah. But like before he teams with Big Show, it's awful. It, yeah. His run is terrible. Fucking god awful, man. Like all all <laughs> of that was just yeah. the worst fucking television ever. I'd argue that the first iteration of Kane all the way up until Katie Vick was great, and then they fucked him over with that, and then everything else onward. Yeah. I feel like he's just lucky that he's just such a talent that, like, um, he's still thought of as a legend just because he has that, he has such that longevity and the business yeah. and all that yeah, kind of that, stuff. That's why. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean... But let's... You know... I mean, let's also talk. I mean, it's not just WWE. Casey and I have talked about this. It was also Glenn Jacobs being a little bit too way unselfish. too self- Yeah, way too un- selfless. Yeah, for his own good, I think. Yeah, he is a very selfless performer, which is why I think he just, you know, he, they had him do anything and he'll do it without any questions asked. And yeah. that was part of the fucking problem, I think. Yeah, because like, there's no way that he should have been booked that bad, you know. Yeah. Then, and and uh, the thing so, is, him losing the mask could have been a rejuvenation of his career, and they fucking bungled that. Yeah, definitely. And then when he put the mask back on, the same thing could have happened, but then they bungled that, too. It's like, what? I, like, this dude got... I think he should have been the one to take the fucking belt off of Goldberg. Full on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because then at least he would have been, you know, better off. But then again, if you do it that way. You kind of have yeah, the issue like, of like you don't get the awesome triple threat matches that we get, which we're gonna be yeah. doing one of them soon. But yeah, I don't so know, man. Like, like it, at the very least, Intercontinental title run. Have him, have yeah. him do something that isn't him jobbing out. <laughs> yeah, just something. Yeah, I think it would also. If you remember doing the draft, he like didn't even want to be on the same show as Taker. If you remember There's that segment where he says, "I better not be on the same show as the Undertaker." It's like, what are you doing with this guy? Like, this guy yeah, is. I better not be on the same show with the Undertaker. I'm scared of my brother. What the fuck? <laughs> they like you. Like yeah, we 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 do have all these moments where you talk about Kane, and he as much of his legend as he is in this business. But like you really think about it, like this dude got fu- like this dude should be a lot more than what he was. Honestly, like it, you made him. If you had made him a star, he wouldn't have had to continue wrestling for as long as he. As yeah, he like, yeah, he would have retired way earlier. Yeah. Um. Next, it shows an ad for Judgment Day 2004 advertising the main event of that show. Um, they just started the JBL. You're wrong. <laughs> They did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Sorry. Then we had the main event. Um, I was going to say not the show, so you could stay here, but you're not Chris, so you you, you, you would stay here anyways. Yeah. Um, main event. It was, for, it was for the World Heavyweight Championship. It was uh, Chris Benoit defending against Triple H and Shawn Michaels. Uh, hell of a feud this was. This was obviously the rematch from... Uh, WrestleMania 20, they had that classic triple threat match. Um, I've never seen that match. I still got, we have to fix that probably next year. Um, right, yeah. Because we never did, we, ne- we, we never had time to do that for retro because it was just so much chaos. There was way, yeah, we'll do that for next year's Mania. We, we've done a lot of Manias now where we could probably slow it down, honestly, yeah. next year. But uh, going through it, uh, yeah, so um, they had that classic triple threat match where Chris Benoit won the belts. Um, and they continued the feud over, um, where, uh, I really like the way they handled this feud where, uh, Triple H wanted to get back his world heavyweight championship. You know, it it was, it was his obsession. We could say a lot about, uh, Triple H on the reign of terror. And at least the one thing we could say is at least he can't, I feel like the way, what makes the reign of terror better than the, the, the Cena one is at least Triple H cared when he lost his championship. At least he cared. Yeah. That was a, 
Yeah, that was a big thing. Like, he was booked to give a shit about that title. Yeah. Uh, that's a very like he, good point, actually, yeah. Um, so, yeah, even though he gets the title annoyingly, at least he cares when he has his championship and when he doesn't. Like, he loses his mind. Yeah, made, made the title it. feel important, yeah. Yeah. And Shawn Michaels wanted to get the championship um, because he felt like, you know, he wasn't really submitted or pinned when he uh, uh, lost the triple threat match at WrestleMania. And the biggest thing was, did Chris Benoit just get lucky? Was this just a lightning in the bottle type of thing? Was this just a Cinderella story, a one-hit wonder type of thing? And Chris Benoit wanted to prove everybody won, so he wanted to have this triple threat rematch. And it was just like a really good uh, program. Really good, Chris yeah, Benoit. really good build up. Real quick before we continue with the breakdown here. I feel like when he started teaming with Xbox Game, became too human. He, he uh, ceased to be a monster and now... Uh, and now was saying "suck it" without his voice box gimmick. How? Okay, yes. There, there's a caveat though with that, JJ. He, they couldn't keep that going forever. There's yeah. no way they could have kept that because that's just not character progression. I, I didn't mind that they did what they did with Kane. Although he's still, I wish he still got the fucking girl, as did everybody else. But that's neither here nor fucking there, and that's why Xbox got the heat for so long. At but, least he still looked like at least he still looked like a monster, though. Yeah, he still looked like a monster. He still looked fucking cool, and everybody fucking loved him. Right? He, there was no fucking uh, drop in popularity with him. Um, everything was great still with him. Like, even if they booked him in that X-Pac thing, it was like the one lull. He came out I mean, the, looking like a million bucks while X-Pac got the fucking shaft. So, I like... Mean, we, talk, we talked about the Backlash 99 retro. He gets probably the biggest pop of the whole night at Backlash. Yeah, That's, like... And, see, and, and, and the other thing, too, is Kane, in full gimmick... And I, I've even mentioned this. He goes on to the... the uh, What do you call it? The weakest link. Fucking wins that competition. Right? Yeah. Looked like a fucking... It looked like one of the most intelligent people on planet Earth. Right? They should have done something with that anyway. They started to do that with... Uh, and they should have kind of humanized him a little bit because of that. I, yeah. I don't even necessarily disagree that they shouldn't have. Because if, if you don't, we don't get the Canaanites promo, which is all-timer shit. You know it is, I mean? yeah. Like, that's all-timer classic shit. And, like... If you don't, if you do, um, if you keep his voice box gimmick, he doesn't get to cut, you know, good fucking promos where, you know, uh, we don't get the hurricane moment where he just lips his Terry because he's excited he won the world tag titles. Like, yeah. it's shit like that that's like, yeah, okay, this this is the type of shit I can get behind wasn't, with Kane. Wasn't know? Kane, too, like, during that time, wasn't Kane, like, the Intercontinental and World Tag Team Champion, like, at the same time? Yes, like that? yes, he was, he was, a, this was right before Katie Vick, and then Katie Vick happened, and then I fucked him, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, honestly, like, plus, too, like, you couldn't keep Paul Bear around forever, so Kane had to learn how to talk somehow, like, you had to yeah, have Kane talk somehow. you know, he could, he, he, hey, listen, surgery's a thing, he could get his voice box prepared, that's what happened. You know? Yeah. Easy. I, I, I don't have an issue with him being more human. It's how they went about it towards the later stages in when it went from WWF to E that I have a fucking issue with it. I mean, Team Hell No showed that it could do that it could happen. It can fucking work. Week. It absolutely can work. You just have to fucking you know, actually treat it with some level of fucking respect. Hell, yeah. you want to have him go back to the monster he used to be in some cases, the whole take off the mask thing, and then he becomes a monster again. Yeah, that works. You know, but let's fucking work with this, you know, yeah. instead of just doing what they did before. I mean, if you remember the one of the entertaining things, it's like the last big program that he has before he becomes a part-timer was when he was a uh, direct Director of Operations, Glenn Jacobs Kane, and Mass Kane, like, at the same time. That was, like, that was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> just because, yeah, just because, well, mainly because he would always have the shit-eating green as uh, Libertarian Kane. He was like, hi, Steph, hi, Triple H. <laughs> this is awesome. I feel like, too, that's what made him more scary, because if you remember, he would break into those moments where, like, he acted Motherfucker like Motherfucker looked unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... We only got it for some one night. We got con remember concessions, Kane. That ooh, concessions, concessions Kane awesome. is goaded. Oh fuck! 
yeah, like, you know, certain things about it can fucking work. It's it's just like, mm. they, they went about it in such a haphazard fucking way. In, yeah. Like, and, and that's the thing. In 2001, 2002, they actually did a pretty decent job at it. Yeah. And then they fucking fall off a cliff after Katie Vick. It's just like, ah, eh, it's gone. Oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah. And then he didn't win the belt. He didn't, he win, didn't the win the belt. He didn't even belt. win the belt. How dare you? What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's so bad. But yeah, going through, um, I feel like I broke it down the kind of the reasoning for this match. Let's kind of start going through the match itself. Uh, Triple H clearly is the heel in the match, but he's not the big. Believe it or not, he's not the biggest heel in the Shawn match. Shawn Michaels was because they were in Canada, <laughs> and I loved it too because you would have actually thought he was a heel because even though he comes out with his face entrance, it's actually a heel entrance. Uh, when you actually watch it with the crowd booing and everything, yeah, yeah, the crowd is booing him, and he knew it too. Like he was already fucking. You know, given the face, it's like, all right, fuck y'all. <laughs> you know, you still don't forgive me? Fuck you then. <laughs> yeah, the, commenta- the commentary team is doing really well. And I like, too, like, Jim Ross has to, like, Jimmy the Kid Law is like, wait, what's, what's, why is it my boo with Shawn Michaels here? Like, Jim Ross has to remind Jerry Law. Like, wait, what, what do you want the call that night, dude? Like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, Listen, you were, the you, call were you there in Montreal? <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, ah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Jay I wish Jay had said that, but he never did. That would have been awesome. Like Dude, um, it was that was so cool. That was it really and then when Ben Walk came out, holy ovation, bro. Yeah. Like, he came in like the hometown hero. Like yeah. they just fucking Wait. went off for this guy. This is stone cold level pop here for for him yeah. like, walking out with the big gold. The, they show his family in the crowd. We're going to move on from that because uh, we don't want to talk about that anymore. Yeah, um, yeah. I will say, too, 2004 and 2007, boy, what a difference three years makes. Benoit mm. was in his hometown in Atlanta, gave nothing of a fuck, really. Just didn't even realize where he was. Didn't even. I don't even think he cared, wasn't even cognizant enough to realize. Here... Couldn't wipe the smile off his face with the ovation yeah. he was getting here. Like, that is a huge jumping off point. Like, when you, if you watch this show after watching Backlash 07, like, the difference is night and day. It's fucking eerie. Like, like, oh, yeah, not, even, that's he's not even the same, yeah. he's not even the same guy anymore. You know, it, it, he looks miserable in 07. He looked like elated here. Yeah, I f- yeah, because I forgot ba- that's what backlash was that year. So yeah, yeah, no seven, yeah. Oh, that's it. So I guess that even though it ends up, it, and that is kind of poetic though in a sense that like the back, um, the last two backlashes I think that Ben Wa- well I, the last three I guess because I forget he, he does wrestle in 05 because the drafts later that year. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The last like at least like two of the three backlashes he got to at least like wrestle, um. At least in his hometown and in his, like, current town type of thing. So, that is kind of cool if you think about it that way, I guess. Yeah, um, but it's, it's still very depressing because you know yeah. you, you know where it leads to. I remember, too, and I mean, I know in the back last 07 match, like, he does a lot in that match, but not as much as he does in this match. Like, like here. I don't know if you talked about it in your retro, but I remember, like, yeah, in that retro, like, he gets dominated in that, in that match. He so. does, he does, yeah. But yeah, going through this match though, um, yeah. So uh, the the match starts. Uh, Chris Benoit and Shawn Michaels uh, double team uh, Triple H, and they beat him up in the corner. And I think the thing that was funny about this was you could just tell that Shawn Michaels was just trying to leech off of Chris Benoit's like popularity here. You could totally tell that's what he was trying to do. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course he was. Yeah, he knew he knew he would be the biggest heel in the building. <laughs> So I think like, that thing I liked about heat on you, bitch. <laughs> I think the thing I loved about this is uh, Chris Benoit, like what the the beat up Shawn Michael. No, so they beat up Triple H in the corner, and uh, like doing this, like Chris Benoit just takes like a random like out of nowhere chop like onto Shawn Michaels. Like it was like, completely out of nowhere. Like they were big punks doing stuff, and he just does like a chop out of, out of nowhere. It was hilarious. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I remember too, like Shawn Michaels. I think this was kayfabe. Like says, let's work together to take this guy out. What are you doing here? Like it was just like hilarious. It was really funny. Yeah. And then they do it. 
They hit a double back suplex onto uh, Triple H, and Shawn Michaels closed one him out of the win. And then he hits a chop on Chris Benoit, and then they just start fighting with each other. Um, you know, they kind of go at it with each, uh, each other a little bit. It's some fun stuff. Triple H gets back in the win, and he just starts. He takes out um, Shawn Michaels' head with a really good high knee, and he uh, hits a suplex onto Chris Benoit. That was some really good stuff. Um, he uh, dominates the match for a bit. And during this match, uh, Jerry Lawler like talks about how Triple H actually is the one with the biggest disadvantage here. Because as you just saw, everyone's going to work together to take out uh, you know, um, Triple H here. They're going to buddy up with each other. And Jim Ross is just like, I wouldn't exactly call Sha uh, Shawn Michaels and Chris Benoit buddies. So then it's like, what would you call him here? And he says... Uh, people with a mutual cause. It's like this is the mutual. So you're telling me they don't they don't both don't want to win the world title? He's like that's not what I'm saying. They just don't want Triple H to win. See, you just proved my point. Like Lala was so happy when Jim Ross finally had to admit he was right. It was it was great. Yeah, um, like, finally I'm right. Yay, <laughs> <laughs> yay. Oh, nobody tries to change his pick doing this show, by the way, because he has a tendency to do that a lot. So he he does. Um, he he likes to change his pick a ton. Yeah. At one point in the match, like Jim Ross was talking about Benoit's life story about how he left Canada with only twelve dollars and he just is like, How do you get out of Canada with only twelve dollars? Doesn't even make sense, Jay. What are you talking about? It's just like, well that, that, that's I'm just we I'm just presenting the facts. That's what happened. That's the true story. Yeah, that's um, true. Anyway, I remember too doing the uh Cactus Jack match. I wanna make sure I say this. At one point, uh Jerry Law, uh, they were talking about how Jim Ross was talking to Mick Foley earlier in the day, and Jim Ross like asked Mick Foley about his weight, and Jerry Law was just like, "Wait a minute, you asked him about his weight, but you didn't ask what he was planning on doing with Randy Orton." He's like, "Oh no, I asked about that. We talked about it." He says, "You didn't go, Randy, you didn't go warn Randy Orton about it. Like it was just so great." <laughs> yeah, man, he's great. He's so great. I love to I love that J to think that Jr. And Mick, so Jr. knew that Mick Foley was planning to do most of that stuff, and still we acted like he never seen it before. Though, like he was like he couldn't believe it type of thing. Like right, exactly, yeah. Um, but yeah, continuing the breakdown of the match, um, they fight onto the outside. Um, Benoit gets like thrown into the steps. I think like three times in this match. It was bad. Like he gets shoulder first, head first, and like it was just like he just gets fucked. Yeah, by these guys. <laughs> DX just fucks yeah. him up. Um, you know. Um, eventually, uh, Shawn Michaels does a uh, half crab on a Triple H, but he's able to get to the ropes, which is somehow a rope break, even though it's a triple threat match. But whatever. Um, referee takes a bump in the match, and they do a really good callback here. And it, they knew where they were, and they played up to it. Shawn Michaels locks um, Chris Benoit into the sharpshooter. They have Earl Hebner run out, take over the match, and he does almost the exact same thing. Like, the mannerisms, everything is the same almost from Montreal. Obviously, he's not going to screw him over, but the way he's, like, asking if Benoit right, wants to yeah, submit, yeah, it's yeah. like not mirrors the Montreal screw job. And Triple H breaks up the submission. But the booze that Shawn Michaels got here... And I will say, when Chris Benoit locked Shawn Michaels into the crossface later in the match, that place erupted yeah, when that happened. erupted is the word. <laughs> like, there was like three volcanic eruptions probably going on. So, um, And then uh, eventually triple, uh, they, they fight to the outside, and Shawn Michaels, you're like, okay, he's clearly going to hit this dive here. They're set up like they're going to hit it. No, he doesn't hit the dive. He they, he completely misses a high cross body, and he goes completely through the Spanish announce table. And the table probably broke his fall a bit, but there's no way that could have felt good. He probably hit no the chairs way. on the way down. No like way. it that was felt just good at all. No way. Chris Benoit has like this look of shock on his face that he can't believe it, like concern. And Triple H ambushes him from behind, throws him head first into the post. And Triple H completely dominates Benoit, just really takes him over. Eventually, Benoit makes a comeback, hits a couple of Germans on the Triple H, hits the diamond headbutt on him, but uh, Triple H kicks out of it. And then eventually, Triple H hits the uh, pedigree on Benoit, and he takes his time going for the pinfall. And you're thinking it's going to be WrestleMania 19 all over again where he's going to get the pin. But Shawn Michaels comes in and just breaks up the pinfall, like, just um, at the nick of time, which is really good. Yeah. And then uh, Shawn Michaels does his comeback. And there's a really good spot here where Shawn Michaels could have hit the sweet chin music on Triple H and won the championship. But he sees Benoit getting up on the apron, and he hits the sweet chin music onto Chris Benoit instead. Yeah, um, that was really good. 
And then he gets hit with a spy buster by Triple H, and he the, 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 that was probably the biggest prop Triple H has gotten since like he returned in 02 that year when Shawn Michaels. I remember this one bit too, by the way, where uh, I think like Shawn gets hit with like a pedigree. No, he gets he gets hit with like a pedigree or something, or like some type of submission move, and the crowd boos when he kicks out. I'm like, wait, why did you boo that? Like. You realize if he didn't kick out there, like Benoit would have lost. That's how much they hated Shawn Michaels here. Like he they couldn't even kick out him, of. Yeah. Um. Eventually, Triple H grabs a slug hammer, hits Shawn Michaels right across the back with it, and then he hits him. Uh, he goes to hit him right off the head, and Benoit pulls him out of the ring. They fight. Um, and uh, Benoit throws Triple H over the barricade, and um, yeah, that was good stuff. And then eventually, um. They fight into the win, and Chris Benoit locks Shawn Michaels into the sharpshooter, and it looks like Shawn's going to get to the ropes, and then he, when he pulls away, um, Triple H is getting to his feet, and he, he's, he got busted open at this point, um, and I think he got slingshot into the pose. That's how he got busted open. And then uh, just before he can break up the submission, Shawn Michaels taps. I thought that was a really good finish right there. That was such um, a great finish. Chris Benoit retains the World Heavyweight Championship, Crowd goes ballistic. His family goes ballistic. This match is four and a half stars. I thought this was just a great match. Yeah, this was yeah, such really a great world good. title match. I gave it four and three quarter. I, I really enjoy it. I thought yeah. they played it perfectly. It was a great main event, great world title match. Honestly, probably the best uh, triple threat, uh, even more so than 20, because I've seen I'm 20. Not, I yeah, really I'll go four and three quarter. enjoy it. I really go, enjoy, enjoyed this match here. I'll go four and three quarter. Funny thing is, I because I watched this show today. That that's gonna be the retro tomorrow. I got to see two of the best triple threat matches in the span of one day. I don't think a lot of people can say that. So that is um, true. That is true. I mean, obviously, it'd be better if it was probably the twenty one, but you know, this is still a great one. Um, and yeah, that's the end of uh, this show. We're not, we don't need to do any career retrospectives on anybody because we know where everybody is. Um, so there you go. Um, so let's start with you. What would you give this show as like a letter grade? Uh, I think I'd give it like an A minus. I think there was a couple lulls in the show, but otherwise it was pretty good. I'm gonna go uh, B plus. I thought this was a great show. Um, the main events really uh, make this show. I like Flair versus Benjamin. Um, I like the women's match. Yeah. Women's match was oh good. the women's match was great too. Uh, actually, you know what? Then I will go eight minus because yeah, I forgot the women's match is good and the handicap match is good. The thing that really dragged this show down is uh, the Tajiri Coachman match, which could have been something special if they didn't if the finish didn't fuck it up. Yeah. And obviously, uh, the cool down match doesn't really bother me, and obviously Kane versus Edge bothered me. So yeah, um, and obviously Sunday Night Heat bothered me because uh, you know it was just it was just it was a failure. Um, yeah, so there you go. There you go. That's, uh, you know... Um, That's the show. We didn't have a single problem being live this time around, although it's only been an hour, but... Yeah, seems, so... Seems like, we were, seems like we were fine now. I don't know. I did I did post... I did make it public after a little bit also, so that that seemed to have worked. Yeah, so we have to... We're going to combine these videos together. Yeah, we're going to so. we're gonna combine these videos. If you see it, upload it again. Obviously, the other two are going to be deleted, and then you, you can watch it after the fact. But, yeah... Um, good shit. We at least seem to hopefully figure out the fucking problem. Uh, I, di I did switch Wi-Fi, uh, signals to try and get a good Wi-Fi thing going. So it, it seems yeah. to have worked. Um, so that, that's good. So hopefully that, then maybe that's what I needed. Maybe I just needed to actually put that in there and actually get it to work that way. But yeah, that's been it. Uh, you guys can stay tuned for, uh... We got to do Unbreakable 05 tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We do it a different day because I, I haven't actually watched it yet. And I'm just realizing that now. So Sure. Sure. Uh, What day? So, might as well say it on the air. So we can't do it Wednesday. All right, so let me go through the schedule. This is, just, you you and, this is just you and me pick, right? So we don't have to wait for Chris or anything. No, we don't. Okay, so let's just do it. Uh, let's just do it Sunday at like, I don't know, 9.30 a.m. or something. Well, okay, but I don't want to do two. I don't want to do double or nothing in that show the same day because double or nothing is going to be a long red show. I know. So can we move double or nothing then to a different day? Like sad. Fuck like the, the, well, like the, no. If you if you when is when is a uh, double or nothing then? 
what um, time is Double or Nothing? It's six thirty, but I ha- I PM? don't know. What I- yeah. Oh shit. And okay, it's not- I guess I guess I'm homebound that day. Shit. Okay, so do that then if that's the case. Uh, I'll yeah. see if no, because no, I could see because Noah, I could see if Noah's available like the Saturday uh, before I leave, which is like the fourteenth. Nah, just do it, just do it then. I don't want to have to fucking try and reschedule that. Um, all right. So what about Saturday then? What about Saturday in the morning? Well, we're doing the, oh, the shit, yeah, yeah, uh, All right. Well, we're gonna uh, either way. We're gonna have to do two videos in one because I, I I need time to watch that f- show. <laughs> yeah. Well, what if we did it, uh, what if we did it Tuesday? Um, we'll just do two, uh, two retros on Tuesday. We'll do, we'll, cause we'll, we'll do retro and I'll do spark later in the night. Like that. You'll, you'll only have to Oh, do that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cause you're doing spark with no or, or zero. That's right. I forgot. Okay. Yeah. Then that's fine. That's perfect. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. All right, so that's what, put... that's what you guys got to look forward to is uh, okay. hopefully an so... uninterrupted stream of Unbreakable uh, and yeah. Double or Nothing on Sunday and also Aftershock or and Spark. Hopefully we get yeah. that working. So, yeah, let's hope. So do your plugs and then I'll do my plugs since I got a lot of stuff to play. Okay, so, yeah, I don't really have much to plug, but you guys can, uh, you know... F- Follow me on YouTube and on all the channels and just look at, for me in the description for right now. I'm okay. still in the midst of trying to make sure everything is edited for his other channel and also yeah. editing stuff a little bit for Zero's channel because uh, Zero is going to be doing an Impact show every every other week and all sorts of shit. So things are coming. Things are looking up for FTW Productions. Hopefully the Wi-Fi... Yeah. Stays on going forward. I guess it's I guess it's kind of a good thing that this happened, like versus the launch of all the Talkinator studios. I guess it's a good thing that this yeah, it's, it's a good thing we that. ran into this problem now. Yeah, but yeah, let's go. I'll go through my stuff. So some of this I'm saying it for my benefit since we just had some changes. So no videos tomorrow, uh, which I think we need a break anyways. After that, uh, yeah. Saturday nine thirty. So not so Saturday, um, May six two thousand twenty three at one. Uh, no, sorry. It's at, a, nine, it's at nine o'clock p.m. aftershock. No, no. WWE aftershock Saturday, May six, two thousand twenty-three, nine a.m. Uh, EST aftershock. Wait, what are you talking about? That's that's the sixth. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I yeah. said. I literally just said that nine o'clock p.m. A, uh, nine o'clock a.m. aftershock. No, you said p.m. Oh, uh, my bad then. Fuck. Yeah. So, WWE Aftershock, Saturday, May 6, 2023, uh, 9 a.m. EST, EST. Um, and then uh, Sunday, I might change it to uh, 8.30, mm-hmm. would that be okay, just in case, uh, it would be double or nothing, uh, May 7, 2023, it's going to be 6.30 or 8.30, um, but I'm so decided on that. And then WWE make it, aftershock. Make it, at, make it 8.30 and just let, I'll, I'll let, I'll, I'll let no one know that it's going to be 8.30. Yeah, WWE Aftershock Extra covering Backlash, um, Monday, May 8th, 2023 at 12.30 p.m. EST, um, Retro Wrestling Review Series, um, so now it's going to be TNA Unbreakable, um, 2005, uh, May 9th, 2023, um, that'll be a, would, would 1.30 be okay? No, that's fine. a 9, didn't May you say 9.30? You said Try to do, do do it at nine thirty, yeah, because then I I'll I'll be up to do it by then. And then uh, later in the night, at some point, will be AEW spoke. Uh, so I have to focus on watching this week's stuff. Like Dino, there's only two shows. I have there's to watch only two shows now. Yeah, Dynamite and Rampage. That's it. And then at some point, um, we're gonna do United Champions and uh, Battleground uh, retros, and we may not because we've had this issue now. We may not be able to. Do the Judgment Day 2000 and Raw Mo 98 retros, but I'm gonna try to see if I can make it work. Yeah, we'll try to make it work. At the very, at, oh, the, yeah. ver- at the very least, we'll be able to fucking sneak it in uh, if if we do two in one day and then just do it later. Yeah, uh, but we'll see. Well, that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you guys for watching. And since this is being uh, live streams last recorded like in the past, 
You know what? Whatever. I don't, I'm not trying. This time. <laughs> God I'm not... damn it. Uh, live streamed in the present, and you're watching this in the past on demand. Talk to you all in the future. Bye. We doing all the classics, you heard it, then I grabbed it, flow like Method Man, then run like I'm rabbit. Soon as I hear the bass line, it be my FaceTime, music's in my veins, so just in case I'm without my iPod or a media player, I'll check my